Prologue. Tessa. As I stare into the familiar face of this stranger, memories flood me. I used to sit there, brushing the hair on my blonde Barbie doll. Often, I'd wish that I was the doll, she had it made. She was beautiful, she was always groomed, always exactly who she was supposed to be. Her parents must be proud, I used to think. Her father, wherever he was, was probably a big CEO, traveling the world to make a life for his family, while her mother stayed back and took care of the house. Barbie's father would never come home stumbling and yelling. He wouldn't scream at her mother so loudly that Barbie would hide in the greenhouse to get away from all the noise and the breaking dishes. And if, by chance, some small, easily explainable misunderstanding had caused an argument between her parents, Barbie always had Ken, her perfect blonde boyfriend, to keep her company even in the greenhouse. Barbie was perfect, so she would have the perfect life, with perfect parents. My father, who left me nine years ago, is standing in front of me, dirty and haggard. Nothing like he should be, nothing like I remember. A smile covers his face as he stares at me, and another memory surfaces. My father, the night he left my mother's face set in stone. She didn't cry. She just stood there, waiting for him to walk out the door. That night she changed. She wasn't the same loving mother anymore after that. She became something unkind, and distant, and unhappy. But she was there, after he decided not to be. Chapter 1. Tessa. Dad. This man in front of me couldn't possibly be my father, despite the familiar brown eyes staring back at me. Tessie? His voice is thicker sounding than I recall from my distant memories. Hardin turns to me, eyes blazing, and then back to my father. My father. Here, in this bad neighborhood, with filthy clothes on his back. Tessie? Is that really you? He asks. I'm frozen. I have no words to say to this drunken man wearing my father's face. Hardin puts a hand on my shoulder in an attempt to elicit a reaction from me. Tessa I take a step toward the strange man, and he smiles. His brown beard is peppered with gray, his smile isn't white and clean like I remember how did he end up this way? All the hope I once held that my father would have changed his life around the way Ken did has vanished, and the realization that this man is actually my father hurts worse than it should. It's me, someone says, and after a moment I realize the words came from me. He closes the space between us and wraps his arms around me. I can't believe it. Here you are. I've been trying to. He's cut short by hard in pulling him away from me. I step back, unsure how to behave. The stranger, my father, looks between Hardin and me, alert and in disbelief. But shortly he eases back into a nonchalant posture and keeps his distance, for which I'm glad. I've been trying to find you for months, he says, wiping his hand across his forehead, leaving a smudge of dirt on his skin. Hardin stands in front of me, ready to pounce. I've been here, I say quietly, peering around his shoulder. I'm thankful for his protection, and it dawns on me that he must be completely confused. My father turns to him, looks him up and down for a while. Wow. Noah Shur has changed a lot. No, that's Hardin, I tell him. My father shuffles around him a little, and inches closer to me, and I can see that Hardin tenses when he moves. This close, I can smell him. It's either the liquor on his breath, or the byproduct of abusing liquor, that has him confusing the two. Hardin and Noah are polar opposites, and could never be compared to each other. My father swings an arm around me, and Hardin gives me a look, but I shake my head slightly, to keep him at bay. Who's he? My father keeps his arm around me for an uncomfortably long time, while Hardin just stands there, looking like he's going to explode, not necessarily out of anger, I realize, he just seems to have no clue what to say or do. That makes two of us. He's my heart and's my boyfriend. I'm her boyfriend, he finishes for me. The man's browner eyes go white as he finally takes in Hardin's appearance. Nice to meet you Hardin. I'm Richard. He reaches his dirty hand out to shake Hardin's. Em yeah, nice to meet you. Hardin is clearly very unsettled. What are the two of you doing out around here? I take this opportunity to move away from my father and stand next to Hardin, who snaps back to himself 
and pulls me to his side. Hardin was getting a tattoo, I answer robotically. My mind is unable to comprehend all that's happening right now. Ah nice. I've used this place before myself. Images of my father, having coffee before leaving the house every morning, to go to work fill my mind. He looked nothing like this, he spoke nothing like this, and he sure as hell didn't tattoo himself back when I knew him. When I was his little girl. Yeah, my friend Tom does them. He pushes up the sleeve of his sweatshirt to reveal what resembles a skull on his forearm. It doesn't look like it belongs on him, but as I continue to examine him, I begin to see that maybe it does. Oh is all I can manage. This is so awkward. This man is my father, the man who left my mother and me alone. And he's here in front of me drunk. And I don't know what to think. Part of me is excited, a small part, that I don't want to acknowledge at the moment. I had secretly been hoping to see him again since the day my mother mentioned he was back in the area. I know it's silly, stupid, really, but in a way he seems better than before. He's drunk and possibly homeless, but I have missed him more than I realized, and maybe he's just had a rough time lately. Who am I to judge this man, when I don't know anything about him? When I look at him, and at the streets surrounding us, it's bizarre to see that everything is moving along as it normally should. I could have sworn time stopped when my father stumbled in front of us. Where are you living? I ask. Hardin's defensive gaze is set on my father, watching him like he's a dangerous predator. I'm in between places right now. He wipes his forehead with his sleeve. Oh. I was working down at Raymark, but I got laid off, he tells me. I vaguely recall hearing the name Raymark before. I think it's a manufacturer. He's been doing factory work? What have you been up to? It's been, what five years? I can feel hard and stiff in next to me as I say, no, it's been nine. Nine years? I'm sorry Tessie. His words are slightly slurred. His nickname for me makes my heart sink, that name was used in the best of times. In the time when he would lift me up onto his shoulders and run through our small yard, the time before he left. I don't know what to make of this. I want to cry, because I haven't seen him in so long, I want to laugh at the irony of seeing him here, and I want to yell at him for leaving me. It's confusing to see him this way. I remember him as a drunk, but he was an angry drunk then, not a smiling, showing off tattoos and shaking hands with my boyfriend drunk. Maybe he's changed into a nicer man I think it's time to go, Hardin states, looking at my father. I really am sorry, it wasn't all my fault your mother you know how she is. He defends himself, his hands waving in front of him. Please, Teresa, give me a chance, the man begs. Tessa Hardin warns beside me. Give us a second, I say to my father. I grab Hardin by the arm and lead him a few feet away. What the hell are you doing? You weren't actually going to, he begins. He's my dad, Hardin. He's a fucking homeless drunk, he spits with annoyance. Tears prick my eyes from Hardin's truthful but harsh words. I haven't seen him in nine years. Exactly, because he left you. It's a waste of time, Tessa. He glances behind me at my father. I don't care. I want to hear him out. I mean, I guess so. It's not like you're inviting him to the apartment or anything. He shakes his head. If I want to, I will. And if he wants to come, he's coming over. It's my place too, I snap. I look over at my father. He's standing there, wearing dirty clothes, staring down at the concrete in front of him. When was the last time he slept in a bed? Had a meal? The thought makes my heart ache. You weren't seriously considering having him come home with us? Hardin's fingers slide through his hair in a familiar gesture of frustration. Not alive or anything, just for tonight. We could make dinner, I offer. My father looks up and makes eye contact with me. I look away as he starts to smile. Dinner? Tessa, he's a goddamn drunk who hasn't seen you in almost 10 years, and you're talking about making dinner for him? Embarrassed at his outburst, I pull him by the collar closer to me and speak low. He's my father, Hardin, and I don't have a relationship with my mother anymore. That doesn't mean you need to have one with this guy. This isn't going to end well, Tess. You're too damn nice to everyone, 
when they don't deserve it. This is important to me, I tell him, and his eyes soften, before I can point out the irony of his objections. He sighs and tugs at his messy hair in frustration. Damn it, Tessa, this isn't going to end well. You don't know how it will end, Hardin, I whisper and look over at my father, who's running his fingers over his beard. I know Hardin may be right, but I owe it to myself to attempt to get to know this man, or at least to hear what he has to say. I go back over to my father, instinctive apprehension making my voice waver a little. Do you want to come to our place for dinner? Really? He exclaims, hope threading through his face. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. He smiles, and for a brief moment the man I remember flashes through, the man before the liquor, that is. Hardin doesn't say a word as we all walk to the car. I know he's angry, and I understand why. But I also know that his father has changed for the better, he runs our college, for goodness' sakes. Am I so foolish for hoping to witness a similar change in my father? When we approach the car, my father asks, Whoa, this is yours? It's a Capri, right? Late 70s model? Yep. Hardin climbs into the driver's seat. My father doesn't question Hardin's terse response, and I'm glad for it. The radio is set low, and as soon as Hardin revs the engine, we both reach for the knob at the same time in hopes that music will drown out the uncomfortable silence. The whole drive to the apartment, I wonder how my mother would take this. The thought gives me chills, and I try thinking about my upcoming move to Seattle. Nope, that's almost worse. I don't know how to talk about it with Hardin. I close my eyes and lean my head against the window. Hardin's warm hand covers mine, and my nerves begin to calm. Whoa, this is where you live? My father gapes from the back seat when we pull up to our apartment complex. Hardin gives me a subtle here it comes look, and I respond, yeah, we moved in a few months ago. In the elevator, Hardin's protective gaze heats my cheeks, and I give him a small smile, hoping to soften him. It seems to work, but being in our home area with this virtual stranger is just so awkward that I begin to regret inviting him over. It's too late now, though. Hardin unlocks our door and walks inside without turning around, immediately heading to the bedroom without a word. I'll be right back, I tell my father and turn to leave him standing alone in the foyer area. Do you mind, if I use your bathroom, he calls after me. Of course not. It's just down the hall, I say, pointing to the bathroom door without looking. In the other room, Hardin's on the bed, removing his boots. Looking over to the door. He gestures for me to close it. I know you're upset with me, I quietly remark as I walk over to him. I am. I take his face between my hands, my thumbs running over both his cheeks. Don't be. His eyes close in appreciation of my gentle touch, and I feel his arms wrap around my waist. He's going to hurt you. I'm only trying to prevent that from happening. He can't hurt me, what could he possibly do? I haven't seen him in how long? He's probably out there shoving our shit in his bloody pockets now, Hardin huffs, and I can't help but giggle. It's not. Funny, Tessa. I sigh and tilt his chin up to make him look at me. Can you please try to lighten up and be positive about this? It's confusing enough without you sulking around and adding to the pressure. I'm not sulking. I'm trying to protect you. I don't need you to, he's my dad. He's not your dad please? I run my thumb along his lip, and his expression softens. Sighing again, he finally answers, fine, let's go have dinner with this guy, then. God knows he hasn't eaten anything that didn't come from a fucking dumpster in a while. My smile fades and my lip quivers against my will. He notices. I'm sorry, don't cry. He sighs. He hasn't stopped sighing, since we ran into my father outside the tattoo shop. Seeing Hardin's worry, even if, like everything else he does, it's tinged with anger, only adds to the surrealness of the situation. I meant everything I said, but I'll try not to be a dick about it. He rises to his feet and presses his lips to the corner of my mouth. As we exit our bedroom, he mumbles, let's go feed the beggar, which doesn't help my mood much. The man in the living room looks so out of place, gazing around the space, noticing the books on our shelves. I'm going to make dinner. You can watch television? I suggest. 
I can help, he offers. Um, okay. I half smile, and he follows me into the kitchen. Hardin stays in the living room, keeping his distance, as I suspected he would. I can't believe you're all grown up and living on your own, my father says. I reach into the refrigerator to grab a tomato, while I try to collect my scattered thoughts. I'm in college, at WCU. So is Hardin, I reply, leaving out his looming expulsion for obvious reasons. Really? WCU? Wow. He sits down at the table, and I notice that the dirt has been scrubbed from his hands. The spot on his forehead is gone too, and a wet spot on the shoulder of his shirt makes me think he was trying to clean a stain from it. He's nervous too. Knowing that makes me feel a little better. I almost tell him about Seattle and the exciting new direction my life is going in, but I have yet to tell Hardin. My father's resurfacing has added another detour to my roadmap. I don't know how many problems I can deal with before everything ends up collapsing at my feet. I wish I'd been around to see all this happen. I always knew you'd make something of yourself. You weren't around, though, I say tersely. Bill plagues me, as soon as I say the words, but I don't wish to take them back. I know, but I'm here now, and I'm hoping I can make up for that. Those simple words are actually a bit cruel, giving me hope that he might not be so bad after all, that maybe he just needs help to stop drinking. Are you are you still drinking? I am. He looks at his feet. Not as much. I know it looks otherwise right now, but it's been a hard few months that's all. Hardin appears in the doorway of the kitchen, and I know he's battling with himself to stay quiet. I hope he can. I've seen your mom a few times. You have? Yeah. She wouldn't tell me where you were. She looks really good, he says. This is so awkward, him commenting on my mother. Her voice plays in my head, reminding me that this man abandoned us. That this man was the reason she is the way she is today. What happened with the two of you? I place chicken breasts in a pan, the oil crackling and popping as I wait for an answer. I don't want to turn and face him, after asking such a direct and abrupt question, but I just couldn't stop myself from inquiring. We just weren't compatible, she always wanted more than I. Could give her, and you know how she can be. That I do know, but the way he's casually talking about her in such a dismissive tone doesn't sit well with me. Shifting the blame from my mother back to him, I turn quickly and ask, why didn't you call? I did, I always called. I send you gifts every birthday. She didn't tell you that, did she? No. Well, it's true, I did. I missed you, so much all this time. I can't believe you're here, in front of me now. His eyes are luminous and his voice shaky as he stands and walks toward me. I don't know how to react. I don't even know the man anymore, if I ever did. Hardin steps into the kitchen to create a barrier between us, and once again I'm glad for his intrusion. I don't know what to think of all of this. I need to keep physical space between this man and me. I know you can't forgive me. He nearly sobs, and my stomach drops. It's not that. I just need time, before I jump into having you in my life again. I don't even know you, I tell him, and he nods. I know, I know. He sits back down at the table, leaving me to finish preparing dinner. Chapter 2. Harden. Tess's piece of shit sperm donor scarfs down two plates of food before even stopping to take a breath. I'm sure he was starving, living on the streets and all. It's not that I don't feel bad for people who are down on their luck and have hit hard times, it's that this specific man is a drunk and he abandoned his kid, so I don't feel bad for him for a goddamn second. After gulping down some water, he beams at my girl. You're quite the cook, Tessie. I think I'll scream if he calls her that one more time. Thank you. She smiles, like the nice person she is. I can tell his bullshit is seeping in, filling the emotional cracks he created by leaving her when she was a child. I mean it, maybe you could teach me this recipe sometime. For you to use where? In your non-existent kitchen? Sure, she says and stands to clear her plate, grabbing mine on the way. I can go now. I appreciate dinner, Richard, Dick, says and stands. No, you can you can stay tonight, if you want, and we can take you back home in the morning, she says slowly, 
Unsure what words to use to describe his situation. What I'm sure of is that I don't like this shit at all. That would be great, Dick says, rubbing his arms. He's probably itching for a drink right now, the fucking prick. Tessa smiles. Great. I'll go get a pillow and some sheets from the bedroom. Looking at her dad and me for a moment, she must notice how I'm feeling, because she asks, you two will be okay for a minute, right? Her dad laughs. Yeah, I want to get to know him anyway. Oh no, you don't. She frowns at my expression and saunters out of the room, leaving us alone in the kitchen. So, Hardin, where did you meet my Tessa, he asks. I hear her close the door and wait a couple of beats to make sure she's not in earshot. Hardin, he repeats. Let's get something straight, I snarl and lean across the table, startling him. She isn't your Tessa, she's mine. And I know what the fuck you're up to, so don't think for a goddamn second you're fooling me. He raises his hands meekly. I'm not up to anything, I, what do you want, money? What? No, of course I don't want money. I want a relationship with my daughter. You've had nine years to build one, and yet you're only here, because you ran into her in a damn parking lot. It's not like you came looking for her, I bark, having visions of my hands around. His neck. I know. He shakes his head, looking down. I know that I made a lot of mistakes, and I'm going to make up for them. You're drunk, right now, sitting in my kitchen, you're fucking drunk. I know a drunk when I see one. I have no sympathy for a man who leaves his family and doesn't even have his shit together nine years later. I know your intentions are good and it makes me happy to see you try to defend my daughter, but I'm not going to mess this up. I only want to get to know her and you. I stay silent, trying to calm my irate thoughts. You're much nicer when she's around, he observes quietly. You're worse of an actor when she's not around, I retaliate. You have every right not to trust me but for her sake, give me a chance. If you hurt her in any way, you are dead. Maybe I should feel a little remorse about threatening Tess's father like this, but I only feel anger and distrust toward the pathetic drunk. My instincts tell me to protect her, not to sympathize with a drunk stranger. I won't hurt her, he promises. I roll my eyes and take a drink from my glass of water. Thinking his statement somehow settles it, he tries to joke, this talk, our roles should be reversed, you know? But I ignore him and walk into the bedroom. I have to, before Tessa comes out to find me strangling her father. Chapter 3. Tessa. I have a pillow, a blanket, and a towel in my hands. When Hardin storms into the bedroom okay, what happened? I ask, waiting for him to explode, waiting for him to complain that I invited my father to stay without really consulting him first. Harding goes to the bed and lies down on it, then looks over at me. Nothing. We bonded. Then I felt like I'd had enough quality time with our guest and decided to come in here. Please tell me you weren't horrible to him. I barely know my father. The last thing I want is more tension. I kept my hands to myself, he says and closes his eyes. Guess I'll take him a blanket and apologize for your behavior, as always, I say with annoyance. In the living room, I find my father sitting on the floor, picking at the holes in his jeans. He looks up when he hears me. You can sit on the couch, I tell him, and place my bundle on the arm of the couch. I well, I didn't want to get anything on your couch. Embarrassment colors his expression, and my heart aches. Don't worry about that you can take a shower here, and I'm sure Hardin has some clothes you can wear for the night. He doesn't look at me, but lightly protests. I don't want to take advantage. It's okay, really. I'll bring out some clothes. Go ahead and take a shower. Here's a towel for you to use. He gives me a wan smile. Thank you. I'm so glad to see you again. I've missed you, so much and here you are. I'm sorry if Hardin was rude to you. He's protective, he finishes for me. Yeah, I guess he is. He comes off very rude sometimes. It's okay. I'm a man. I can take it. He's just looking out for you, and I don't blame him. He doesn't know me. Hell, neither do you. He reminds me of someone I used to know my father stops and smiles. Who? Me I was just like him. I didn't have respect for anyone who didn't earn it, 
and I ran over anyone who got in my way. I had the same chip on my shoulder that he has, the only difference is he has a lot more tattoos than me. He chuckles, and the sound breathes life into memories I had long forgotten. I enjoy the feeling, and smile along with him until he stands up and grabs the towel. I'm going to take you up on that shower now. I tell him that I'll bring him a change of clothes and place them outside the bathroom door. Back in her room, Hardin is still on the bed, eyes closed and knees bent in front of him. He's taking a shower. I told him he could wear some of your clothes. He sits up. Why would you do that? Because he doesn't have any clothes. I walk toward the bed, arms extended to calm him. Sure, Tessa, go ahead and give him my clothes, he says harshly. Should I offer him my side of the bed too? Do you need to stop, now? He's my father, and I'd like to see where this is going to go. Just because you can't forgive your father doesn't mean you have to sabotage my attempts to have some kind of relationship with mine, I reply, equally harshly. Hardin stares at me. His green eyes narrow, no doubt from the effort, not to say out loud the hateful words he's spewing at me in his head. That's not what this is. You're too naive. How many times do I have to tell you this? Not everyone deserves your kindness, Tessa. I snap, only you, right? Do you the only one I should forgive and give the benefit of the doubt to? That's bullshit, and really pretty selfish of you. I dig through his bottom drawer to grab a pair of sweats. And you know what? I'd rather be naive and capable of seeing the good in people than be a jerk to everyone and assume that everyone is out to get me. I gather up a shirt and some socks and storm out. As I'm placing the pile of clothes by the bathroom door, I hear my father's voice singing softly over the sound of the water. I press my ear to the door and can't help but smile at the wonderful noise. I remember my mother talking about my father's singing and how obnoxious it always was, but I find it lovely. I turn the television back on in the living room and set the remote on the table to encourage him to watch what he wants. Does he watch television? I straighten up the kitchen, leaving some leftovers out on the counter in case he's still hungry. When was the last time he had a real meal? I wonder again. The water is still running in the bathroom. He must be enjoying his hot shower, which tells me that he probably hasn't had a bath in a while. Hardin has his new leather binder that I got him on his lap when I finally go back to the bedroom. I walk by him without making eye contact but then feel his fingers wrap around my arm to stop me. Can we talk, he asks, pulling me to stand between his legs. His hands quickly move his binder out of the way. Go ahead, talk. I'm sorry for being a dick, okay? I just don't know what to think of all this. All of what? Nothing has changed. Yes, it has. This man who neither of us really knows is in my house and he wants to become close with you after all these years. It doesn't add up, and my first instinct is to be defensive. You know that. I hear what you're saying, but you can't be hateful and say those things to me, like calling him a beggar. That really hurt my feelings. He spreads my hands open with his, lacing his fingers through mine, while pulling me even closer to him. I'm sorry, baby, I really am. He brings our hands to his mouth, slowly kissing each of my knuckles and my anger dissolves at the touch of his soft lips. I quirk one eyebrow. Are you going to stop with the cruel comments? Yes. He turns my hand over in his, tracing the lines etched into my palm. Thank you. I watch as his long finger travels up my wrist and back down to my fingertips. Just be careful, okay? Because I won't hesitate to. He seems okay, though, doesn't he? I mean he's nice. I say quietly, interrupting his sure to be violent promise. Hardin's fingers stop their movements. I don't know. He's nice enough, I guess. He wasn't nice when I was younger. Hardin looks at me with serious fire in his eyes, though his words have a gentle tone to them. Don't talk about that while he's this close to me, please. I'm trying my best here, so let's not push it. I climb onto his lap and he lies down with my body against his. Tomorrow's the big day. He sighs. Yeah, I whisper against his arm, nuzzling in his warmth. Hardin's expulsion hearing for beating up said, is scheduled for tomorrow, 
not our finest hour. Suddenly a small feeling of panic shoots through me at the memory of the texts Ed sent me. I'd almost forgotten about it altogether, after seeing my father outside the shop. My phone had vibrated in my pocket as we waited for Steph and Tristan's return, and Hardin had stared at me silently, while I read it. Fortunately he didn't ask me what was up. I need to talk to you tomorrow morning, alone please? Said it written. I don't know what to make of the message, I don't know if I should talk to him about anything, considering he told Tristan he was going to press charges against Hardin. I hope he just said that to impress him, to keep his reputation. I don't know what I'll do, if Hardin gets in trouble, real trouble. I should respond to the message, but I don't think it's the best idea to meet said, or to talk to him alone. Hardin's already in enough of a mess without me adding to it. Are you listening to me? Hardin nudges me, and I look up from the comfort of his embrace. No, sorry. What's on your mind? Everything, tomorrow, the charges, expulsion, England, Seattle, my father I sigh. Everything. You'll come with me, though? To find out about the expulsion? His voice is smooth, yet nervous. If you want me to, I say. I need you to. Then I'll be there. I have to change the subject, so I say, I still can't believe you got that tattoo. Let me see it again. He gently rolls me off of him, so he can turn over. Lift my shirt. I lift the bottom of his black t-shirt until his entire back is laid bare, and then I pull back the white bandage covering the newly engraved words. There's a little blood on the bandage, I tell him. That's normal, he says, humor at my ignorance coming through his words. I outline the reddened area with my finger, taking in the perfect words. The tattoo he got for me is my new favorite. The perfect words, words that have so much meaning for me, and for him as well, apparently. But they're tainted by the news I've chosen to withhold about moving to Seattle. I'll tell him tomorrow, as soon as we find out about the expulsion. I promise myself 100 times that I will. The longer I wait, the more angry he'll be. Is that enough of a commitment for you, Tessie? I scowl at him. Don't call me that. I hate that nickname, he says, turning his head up to look at me, while still lying on his stomach. Me too, but I don't want to tell him that. Anyway, the tattoo is enough for me. You're sure? Because I can go back and get your portrait underneath. He laughs. No, please don't. I shake my head, and his laughter rises. You're sure this'll be enough? He sits up and tugs his shirt back down to cover his body. No marriage, he adds. That's what this was? You got a tattoo as an alternative to marriage? I don't know how I feel about this. No, not exactly. I got the tattoo, because I wanted to, and because I haven't gotten one in a while. Thoughtful. It's for you too, to show you, that I want this. He gestures between us, taking my hand in his. Whatever this is that we have, I don't ever want to lose it. I've lost it before, and even now I don't completely have it back, but I can tell it's getting there. His hand feels warm, and so right holding on to mine. So once again, I use the words of a far more romantic man than myself to get the point across. He smiles a bright smile, but I see the terror beneath it. I think Darcy would be appalled by your use of his famous words, I tease. I think he would high-five me, he boasts. My laughter comes out like a bark. High five? Fitzwilliam Darcy would never do such a thing. You think he's above high fives? He's not. He would sit here and have a beer with me. We would bond over how annoyingly stubborn the women in our lives are. The two of you are lucky to have us, because the Lord knows no one else would put up with either of you. Is that so? He challenges with a dimpled smile. Obviously, you're right, I suppose but I trade you for Elizabeth in a heartbeat. My mouth presses into a straight line, and I raise a brow, expecting an explanation. Only because she shares my views on marriage. But she still got married, I remind him. In a very unhardened like move, he takes my hips in his hands, and pushes me back on the bed, so my head lands on the mountain of decorative pillows that he despises, a fact he never fails to remind me of. That's it. Darcy can have both of you. His laughter fills the room, and mine is equally powerful. 
these little dramas during which we bicker over fictional characters and he laughs like a child are the moments that make all the hell we've put each other through worth every second. Moments like these shield me from the harsh realities we've experienced throughout our relationship and all the obstacles that still lie in front of us. I can hear he's out of the bathroom, Hardin says, his tone guarded. I'm going to say good night. I wrestle out of Hardin's grip, placing a swift kiss on his forehead. In the living room, I find that Hardin's clothes look hot on my father, but at least they fit better than I'd expected. Thanks again for the clothes. I'll leave them here, when I go in the morning, he tells me. It's okay, you can take them, if you need them. He sits on the couch and rests his hands on his lap. You've already done enough for me, more than I deserve. It's okay, really. You're much more understanding than your mom. He smiles. I'm not sure I understand anything right now, but I want to try to get to that point. That's all I'm asking for, just a little time, to get to know my little well, my adult daughter. I give him a tight smile. I'd like that. I know he has a long way to go, and I'm not forgiving him overnight. But he's my father, and I don't have the energy to hate him. I want to believe that he can change. I've seen it happen before. Hardin's father, for example, has completely turned his life around, even if Hardin can't let go of their painful past. I've seen Hardin change too. And since there aren't many people more stubborn than him, I figure there's hope for my father, no matter how bad he may have gotten. Hardin hates me. I've got my work cut out for me here. His sense of humor is contagious, and I chuckle. Yes, yes, you do. I look down the hall at my scowling boyfriend in his solid black clothes, watching us with suspicious eyes. Chapter 4. Tessa. Turn it off, Hardin groans as the alarm rings throughout the dark bedroom. My fingers fumble for my phone, and finally, with a swipe of my thumb across the screen, the unwelcome sound stops. My shoulders feel heavy as I sit up in bed, the weight of today's tensions threatening to pull me back down, the university's decision whether to expel Hardin, the possibility of Zed pressing charges against him, and lastly, Hardin's potential reactions to my telling him I'm planning to follow Vance Publishing to Seattle, and that I want him to come, even though he's professed to hate the city. I can't decide which of these terrifies me the most. By the time I turn the bathroom light on, and splash cool water against my face, I realize that the assault charges are the worst. If Hardin is sent to jail, I honestly have no idea what I would do, or what he would do. The thought alone makes me nauseous. Zed's request to meet with me this morning resurfaces, and my mind reels with all the possibilities of what he could want to talk about, especially since he said something about having fallen in love with me the last time I saw him. I inhale and exhale into the soft towel hanging on the wall. Should I reply to Zed, and at least, see what he has to say? Maybe he can offer an explanation for why he told Tristan one thing and me another about pressing charges. I feel guilty for asking him not to, especially considering how badly Hardin hurt him, but I love Hardin, and Zed had the same intentions as Hardin did, to win a bet, in the beginning. Neither of them is purely innocent here. Before I can overthink the possible repercussions, I text Zed. I'm only trying to help Hardin. I remind myself of that over and over after I hit send, and obsess over my hair and makeup. When I see that the blanket is folded neatly on the arm of the couch, my heart sinks. He left. How will I get hold of him? The soft sound of a cabinet opening in the kitchen picks my heart up from the floor. Going into the dark room, I switch the light on and see my father startle and drop a spoon onto the concrete floor with a clatter. Sorry, I was trying to be as quiet as possible, my father says as he quickly bends to retrieve the utensil. It's okay. I was up. You could have turned the light on. I laugh quietly. I didn't want to wake anyone. I was just trying to make some cereal. I hope that's okay. Of course it is. I start the coffee pot and check the clock. I need to wake Hardin in 15 minutes. What are your plans for today? He asks with a mouthful of frosted flakes, Hardin's favorite. Well, I have class, and Hardin has a meeting with the university board. The university board? That sounds serious I look at my father and wonder, should I tell him? But then, figuring I have to start somewhere, 
I say, he got in a fight on campus. And they're making him talk in front of the board? In my day, you got a slap on the wrist, and that was that. He destroyed a lot of property, expensive property, and he broke the guy's nose. I sigh and stir a spoonful of sugar into my coffee. I need the extra energy today. Nice. So what was the fight about? Me, sort of. It was something that was building over time, and it finally just exploded. Well, I like Hardin even more now than I did last night. He beams. Though I'm glad that he's warming to my boyfriend, it's not for a good reason. I don't want the two of them bonding over violence. I shake my head and gulp down half my coffee, letting the hot liquid soothe my frantic nerves. Where's he from? He sounds genuinely interested in learning more about Hardin. England. Thought that was the accent. Though sometimes I can't tell it from Australian. So his family's still there? His mother is. His father's here. He's the chancellor at WCU. Curiosity fills his brown eyes. Ironic, then, about the expulsion. Very. I sigh. Your mother's met him, he asks, then takes a big spoonful of cereal. Yes, she hates him. I frown. Hate is a strong word. Trust me, in this case it's not strong enough. The ache from the loss of my relationship with my mother is much less potent than it used to be. I don't know whether that's a good thing or not. My father puts down his spoon and nods several times. She can be a little hard-headed. She just worries about you. She doesn't need to. I'm fine. Well, let her be the one to come around, then. You shouldn't have to choose one or the other. He smiles. Your grandma didn't approve of me either. She's probably scowling at me from her grave as we speak. This is all so strange, sitting in my kitchen with my father, bonding over cereal and coffee after all these years. It's just hard, because we've always been close as close as she's capable of, at least. She always wanted you to be just like her. She made sure of that from a young age. She's not a bad person, Tessie. She's just afraid. I look at him quizzically. Of what? Everything. She's afraid of losing control. I'm sure seeing you with Hardin terrified her and made her realize she doesn't have control over you anymore. I stare at the empty cup in front of me. Is that why you left? Because she wanted to control everything? My father sighs softly, an ambiguous sound. No, I left because I have my own issues and we weren't good for one another. Don't worry about us. He chuckles. Worry about yourself and your troublemaker of a boyfriend. I can't picture the man in front of me and my mother being able to hold a conversation. They are just so different. When I glance at the clock, I realize it's past eight. I get up and put my cup in the dishwasher. I need to wake up Hardin. I threw your clothes in the wash last night. I'll get dressed and bring them out. I go into the bedroom and see that Hardin is awake. As I watch him pulling a black t-shirt over his head, I suggest, maybe you should wear something a little more formal to the meeting. Why? Because they're deciding your educational future, and a black t-shirt doesn't show much effort on your end. You can change right after, but I really think you should dress up. Fook. He exaggerates the word and throws his head back. I walk past him and into the closet to retrieve his black button-up shirt and pants. No dress lacks, for the love of God, no. I hand the pants to him. It's only for a little while. He holds the garment like it's nuclear waste or an alien artifact. If I wear this shit, and they still kick me out, I'll burn that whole campus to the ground. You're so dramatic. I roll my eyes at him, but he doesn't look amused as he steps into the dress pants. Is our apartment still operating as a homeless shelter? I drop the shirt, still on the hanger, onto the bed and march to the door. Frantic fingers lace through his hair. Damn it, Tess, I'm sorry. I'm getting anxious, and I can't even fuck you to settle me down, because your dad is on our couch. His vulgar words stir my hormones, but he's right, my father in the other room is a big impediment. I walk over to Hardin, whose long fingers are struggling with the top button on his shirt, and gently move his hands out of the way. Let me, I offer. His eyes soften, but I can tell he's beginning to panic. I hate seeing him this way. It's so foreign. He's so controlled all the time, 
never caring much for anything, except me, and even then he's still pretty good at hiding his feelings. Everything will be fine, babe. It'll work out. Babe. His smile is instant, and so is the flush in my cheeks. Yes, babe. I adjust the collar of his shirt, and he leans over to kiss the tip of my nose. You're right. Worst case scenario, we go to England. I ignore his comment and return to the closet to pick out my own clothes for the day. Do you think he'll let me accompany you inside? I ask him, unsure what to wear. Do you want to? If they allowed. I grab the new purple dress that I plan to wear to Vance tomorrow. I undress and put it on as quickly as possible. I slip on some black heels and exit the closet with my hands holding up the front of the dress. Can you help me? I ask Hardin, turning my back to him. You're purposely torturing me. His fingertips travel across my exposed shoulders and down my back, leaving goosebumps in their wake. Sorry. My mouth is dry. He slowly raises the zipper, and I shiver as his lips press against the sensitive skin on the back of my neck. We need to get going, I tell him, and he groans, fingers digging into my hips. I'm going to call my dad on the way. Are we dropping the your dad off somewhere? I'll ask him now, can you grab my bag? I say, and he nods. Tess, he calls as my hand hits the doorknob. I like that dress. And you. Well, I love you, of course in your new dress, he rambles. I love you, and your fancy clothes. I curtsy and do a little 360, so he can see me. As much as I hate hard in being nervous, it's also very appealing to me, because it reminds me that he's not so tough after all. In the living room, my father is sitting on the couch, having fallen back asleep. I don't know if I should wake him up or just leave him here to rest until we get back from campus. Let him sleep, Hardin answers, sensing my thoughts as he walks up behind me. I quickly scribble a note for him explaining when we'll return, along with our phone numbers. I doubt he has a cell phone but I leave them just in case. The drive to campus is short, too short, and Hardin looks like he's going to either scream or punch something at any moment. When we arrive, he scans the parking lot for Ken's car. He said to meet him here, Hardin says, checking the screen on his phone for the fifth time in five minutes. There he is. I point to the silver car pulling into the lot. Finally. What the fuck took him so long? Be nice to him. He's doing this for you. Please, just be nice to him, I beg, and he sighs in frustration but agrees. Ken has brought his wife, Karen, and Hardin's stepbrother, Landon, which surprises Hardin and makes me smile. I love them so much for supporting him, even when he acts like he doesn't want their help. Don't you have anything better to do? Hardin says to Landon as they approach us. Don't you? Landon retaliates, which makes Hardin laugh. Listening to their exchange, Karen smiles with a brightness completely at odds with how she first appeared when she emerged from Ken's car. As we walk toward the administrative building, Ken says, I'm hoping this won't last long. I've been calling everyone I can to pull as many strings as possible, so I'm praying for the best. He stops for a minute and turns to Hardin. Let me do the talking in there, I mean it. Watching for his son's response, he waits for him to agree. Okay, yeah, Hardin says without argument. Ken nods and swings the big wooden doors open, leading us all inside. Over his shoulder, Ken says authoritatively, Tessa, I'm sorry, but you can't come inside the room with us. I didn't want to push it, but you can wait right outside. He turns and gives me a sympathetic smile. But Hardin immediately goes into full panic mode. What do you mean she can't come inside? I need her in there. I know you do. I'm sorry, but it's family only, his father explains as he leads us down the hall. Unless she was a witness, but even then, that's a huge conflict of interest. Ken stops us in front of a conference room and muses, it's not like I'm not engaged in a conflict of interest, being the chancellor. But you're my son, and let's at least have only one conflict, okay? I turn to Hardin. He's right and it'll be better this way. It's okay, I assure him. He lets go of my hand and nods, looking past me to shoot daggers at his father, who sighs and says, Hardin, please try your best to, 
Hardin holds up one hand. I will, I will, he says and kisses my forehead. As the four of them walk into the room, I want to ask Landon to wait with me, but I know Hardin needs him in there, whether he'll admit it or not. I feel so useless just sitting here outside this room, while a group of stuffy men in suits decides Hardin's educational future. Well, maybe there's one way I can help I pull my phone out and text Zed. I'm at the administrative building, can you come here? I stare at the screen, waiting for a reply, and my phone lights up less than a minute later, yes, I'm on my way. I'll be outside, I send. With one last glance at the door, I head outside. It's cold, too cold to be waiting out here in an E-length dress, but I don't have much of a choice. After waiting a while, I've just decided to go back inside, when Zed's old truck pulls into the parking lot. He steps out, wearing a black sweatshirt and dark wash jeans. The deep bruising on his face shocks me, despite the fact that I just saw him yesterday. He tucks his hands into the pocket on the front of his sweatshirt. Hey. Hey. Thanks for meeting me. It was my idea, remember? He smiles, and I feel slightly less unsettled. I smile in return. I guess you're right. I want to talk to you about what you said at the hospital, he says, which was exactly what I was planning to talk about. So do I. You go first. Steph said you told Tristan your pressing charges against Hardin. I try not to look at his bruised and bloodshot eyes. I did. But you told me you wouldn't press charges. Why lie to me? I'm sure the hurt is clear in my shaky voice. I didn't lie to you. I meant it when I said it. I step closer to him. So what changed your mind? He shrugs. A lot of things. I thought about all the shit he's done to me, and to you. He doesn't deserve to just walk away from this. He gestures to his face. Look at me, for God's sake. I'm not sure what to say to Zed in this moment. He has every right to be upset with Hardin, but I wish he wouldn't take legal action against him. He's already in trouble with the university board, I say, hoping to change his mind. He's not going to get in trouble. Steph told me his dad's the chancellor, he scoffs. Damn it, Steph. Why would you tell him that? I not to acknowledge what he said. That doesn't mean he won't get in trouble. But my saying this only makes him exasperated. Tessa, why are you always so quick to defend him? No matter what he does, you're right there to fight his battles for him. That's not true, I lie. Yes, it is. He throws his hands up in disbelief. You know it is. You told me you'd think about what I said about leaving him but then I see you with him at a tattoo shop days later. It doesn't make sense. I know you don't understand, but I love him. If you love him so much, then why are you running away to Seattle? His words rattle me. I pause for a second, but say, I'm not running to Seattle. I'm going there for a better opportunity. He's not coming with you. Our group of friends talk, you know? What? He was planning to, I lie but I can tell Zed sees right through it. With challenge in his eyes, he looks off to the side, then levels his stare at me. If you can tell me that you have no feelings toward me, none at all, I'll drop the charges. Right then, the air seems to grow colder, the wind stronger. What? Do you heard me? Tell me to leave you alone and never speak to you again, and I'll do it. His request reminds me of something Hardin said to me long ago. But I don't want that. I don't want to never talk again, I admit. So what do you want, then, he asks, his voice tinged with sadness and anger. Because you seem to be just as confused as I am. You keep texting me, and meeting up with me, you kiss me, sleep in the same bed as me, you always come to me when he hurts you. What do you want from me? I thought I'd made my intentions clear at the hospital. I don't know what I want from you, but I love him, and that's never going to change. I'm sorry that I gave you mixed signals, but I, tell me why you're going to Seattle in a week, and haven't told him, he shouts back at me, his arms waving in front of his body. I don't know I'm going to tell him, when I get the chance. You won't tell him, because you know he'll leave you, said snaps, his eyes looking past me. He will I don't know what to say, because I really fear Zed's right. Well, guess what, Tessa? You can thank me later. For what? I watch as his lips turn up into a wicked smile. 
Zed lifts his arm up, gesturing behind me, and a shiver rakes through me. For telling him for you. I know that when I turn around, Hardin will be standing there. I swear I can hear his ragged breathing over the harsh winter wind. Chapter 5. Hardin. When I'd stepped outside, the wind whipped around me, carrying the one voice I didn't expect to hear right now. I just had to endure hearing a lot of people say a lot of bad things about me, and I just had to remain quiet. And afterward, all I wanted to hear was the voice of my girl, my angel. And there was her voice. But there was also his. I turned the corner, and indeed, there he is. There they are. Tessin said. My first thoughts were, why the fuck is he here? Why the fuck is Tessa outside talking to him? What part of stay the fuck away from him does she not fucking get? When that motherfucker raised his voice at her, I started walking toward them, nobody yells at her like that. But when he mentioned Seattle I was stopped in my tracks. Tessa is planning to go to Seattle? And Zed knew, but I didn't. This isn't happening, this can't actually be happening. She would never plan to leave without telling me Zed's wild eyes and shit-eating grin mock me as I try to collect my fucked up thoughts. When Tessa turns to me, her movements are painstakingly slow. Her blue-gray eyes are wide, pupils blown out in surprise when they meet mine. Hard and I can see she's saying the words, but her voice is small, lost in the wind. Unsure what to say, I stand still, while my mouth drops open, closes, opens, back and forth in an endless pattern until the words finally fall from my lips. So this was your plan, then? I manage. She pushes her hair back from her face, her mouth turns to a frown immediately, and she rubs her hands up and down her arms, which are crossed in front of her chest. No. It's not like that, Hardin, I, you two are quite the fucking schemers, aren't you? You I point to the bastard. You fucking scheme and plot behind my back, and try to make a move on my girl, over and fucking over. No matter what I do. No matter how many times I pound your goddamn face in, you still keep crawling back like a fucking cockroach. Amazingly, he dares to speak. She's, and you I point to the blonde girl who has my world under the sharp heel of her black shoe. You, you keep playing mind games with me, acting like you give a fuck, when really you've been planning to leave me this entire time. You know I won't go to Seattle, yet you're planning to run off, without telling me. Her eyes glassy. She pleads with me. That's why I hadn't told you yet, Hardin, because, stop fucking talking, I say, and her hand moves to her chest, like my words are causing her pain. Maybe they are. Maybe I want them to, so she can feel what I feel. How could she humiliate me this way, in front of said, of all people? Why is he here? I ask her. There is no evidence of his smug grin, when she turns to look at him, before looking back at me. I ask him to meet me here. I stagger back in mock surprise. Or maybe it's real surprise, I can't tell what these feelings really are, rushing through me so quickly. Well, there we go. The two of you obviously have something special here. I only wanted to talk to him about the charges. I'm trying to help you, Hardin. Please, just listen to me. She steps toward me, moving her hair from her face again. I shake my head. Bullshit. I heard your entire conversation. If you don't want him, tell him right now, in front of me. Her watery eyes plead silently for me to give in and not make her humiliate him in front of me, but it doesn't sway me. Now, or I'm done with you. My own words burn like acid on my tongue. I don't want you, said, she says, facing me. Her words are rushed, panicked, and I know it's hurting her to say them. At all? I ask mimicking Zed's grin from earlier. At all. She frowns, and he runs his hands through his hair. You never want to see him again, I instruct. Turn and tell him that. But it's Zed who speaks up. Harden, just stop. Leave it alone. I got the message. You don't have to play into his sick game, Tessa. I get it, he says. He looks pathetic, like a sad child. Tessa I start, but when she looks up at me, what I see behind her eyes nearly brings me to my knees. Disgust, she is full of disgust for me. She takes a step toward me. No, Hardin, I won't do it. Not because I want to be with him, because I don't. 
I love you, only you, but you're only doing this to prove a point, and it's ugly, and it's cruel, and I won't help you. She bites the inside of her cheek, trying not to cry. What the hell am I doing? With fiery intensity, she tells me, I'm going home. When you want to talk about Seattle, that's where I'll be. With that, she turns to walk away. You don't have a way to get home. I call to her. Zed reaches out an arm in her direction. I'll take her, he says. Which breaks something in me. If I wasn't already in a bunch of shit because of you, I would kill you right now. I don't just mean break a bone, I mean I would literally crack your skull open against the concrete and watch you bleed out all over this, stop it. Tessa yells as she turns, covering her ears. Tessa, if you, Zed says softly. Zed, I appreciate everything you've done, but you really need to stop. She tries to sound stern but fails miserably. With a final sigh, he turns on his heel and walks away. I head to the car, and as soon as I'm near it, my father and Landon appear, a fucking course. I hear the click of Tessa's heels behind me. We're going, I tell them, before they can get a word in. I'll call you in a little while, she says to Landon. You're still going Wednesday, right? He asks her. She smiles at him, a fake smile to mask the panic behind her eyes. Yeah, of course. Landon glares at me, obviously noticing the tension between us. Does he know about her plan? Probably, he probably helped her develop it. I climb into the car, not even trying to hide my lack of patience. I'll call you, she says again to Landon and waves goodbye to my father before getting in. I immediately turn the music off as she buckles her seatbelt. Go ahead, she says, no emotion in her voice. What? Go ahead and scream at me. I know you're going to. I'm stunned into silence by her assumption. Granted, I had planned on yelling at her, but the way she just expects it throws me off guard. But of course she expects it, that's what always happens. That's what I do. Dot. Well? Her lips are pressed in a hard line. I'm not going to yell at you. She glances over at me momentarily before focusing at some point out beyond the window. I don't know what to do except scream at you. Dot. That's the problem. I sigh in defeat, my forehead resting against the steering wheel. I wasn't planning this behind your back, Harden, not purposely. It sure as hell seems that way. I would never do that to you. I love you. You'll understand when we go over it. Her words bounce right off of me as anger takes over. I understand you're moving, soon. I don't even know when, and we live together, Tessa. We share a fucking bed, and you're going to just leave me? I always knew you would. I hear the click of her seatbelt, and then feel her hand pushing me back by the shoulders. Within seconds she's on my lap, bare thighs straddling me, cold arms wrapped around my neck, her tear-soaked face buried in my chest. Get off of me, I say, attempting to unwrap her arms from me. Why do you always assume I'm going to leave you? She tightens her grip. Because you will. I'm not going to Seattle to leave you, I'm going for myself and my career. It's always been my plan to go there, and this is an incredible opportunity. I asked Mr. Vance while we were figuring out what we were going to do, and I plan on telling you so many times, but you either cut me off, or didn't want to talk about anything serious. All I can think of is her packing her bags, and leaving me with nothing but some bullshit note on the counter. Don't you dare try to blame me. My voice doesn't hold as much conviction as I intended. I'm not blaming you, but I knew you wouldn't be supportive. You know how important this is to me. What are you going to do, then? If you go, I can't be with you. I love you, Tessa, but I'm not going to Seattle. Why? You don't even know, if you'd like it or not. We could at least try it, and if you hate it, we could go to England. Dot. Maybe, she says with a sniffle. You don't know, if you like Seattle either. I look at her with blank eyes. I'm sorry, but you have to choose, me or Seattle. She looks up at me for a moment, then moves back to the passenger seat without a word. You don't have to decide right now, but time is running out. I put the car in drive, and pull out of the small space. I can't believe you're making me choose. She doesn't look at me. You knew how I felt about Seattle. You're lucky I kept my cool back there, when you were with him. 
I'm lucky, she scoffs. This day is shit already. Let's not fight about it. I'm going to need an answer by Friday. Unless, of course, you'll be gone by then. The idea sends a chill through my body. I know she'll choose me, she has to. We can go to England and get away from all this bullshit. She hasn't said a word about missing classes today, which I'm glad for, since that's another fight I don't want to have. You're being so selfish, she accuses. I don't argue, because I know she's right. But I do say, well, some might say selfish is also not telling someone when they plan on leaving them. Where are you going to live? Do you already have a place? No, I was going to look for one tomorrow. We leave Wednesday for the trip with your family. It takes me a moment to realize who she's referring to. We? Do you said you go I'm still trying to recover from the Seattle shit, Tessa. I know I'm being an asshole, but this is so fucked up. And let's not forget you calling Zed, I add, doubling down. Tessa stays silent as I drive. I have to look over at her multiple times to make sure she's still awake. Are you not speaking to me now? I finally ask her as we approach the parking lot of our my apartment. I don't know what to say. Her voice is quiet, defeated. I park, and it hits me. Shit. Your dad's still here, isn't he? I don't know where else he would go she says without looking at me. We get out of the car, and I say, well, when we get upstairs, I'll ask him where he needs to be dropped off at. No, I'll take him she mumbles. Even though my girl's walking next to me, she seems miles away. Chapter 6. Tessa. I'm too disappointed in Hardin to argue, and he's too pissed at me to speak without screaming. He actually handled the news better than I thought he would, but how could he make me choose? He knows how important Seattle is to me, and it's not like he has a problem with me giving something up for him, that's what hurts me the most. He always says he can't be away from me, that he can't live without me, yet he's giving me an ultimatum, and it's not fair. If he took off with any of our shit hard and begins as we get to the door. Enough. Hopefully my exhaustion is heard through my soft dismissal, so he won't press it. Just saying. I push my key into the lock and twist, momentarily considering the possibility of what Hardin has mentioned. I don't know the man, really. Any paranoia I have disappears when we walk inside. My father's body is slumped over the arm of the couch. His mouth is wide open, and deep snores escape from his parted lips. Without another word, Hardin walks into the bedroom, and I go to the kitchen for a glass of water and a minute to think about my next step. The last thing that I want to do is fight with Hardin, but I'm beyond sick of him only thinking of himself. I know he has changed so much, tried so hard, but I've given him chance after chance, resulting in an endless breakup makeup cycle that would make even Catherine Earnshaw cringe. I don't know how long I can keep my head above water when I'm fighting off the tidal wave that we call a relationship. Every time I feel like I've learned to tread its waters, I'm sucked back under by yet another conflict with Hardin. After a few moments, I get up and look over at my father, still snoring in a way I would find amusing if I wasn't so preoccupied. Deciding on a course of action, I head into the bedroom. Hardin is lying on his back, his arms tucked under his head as he stares at the ceiling. I'm about to speak when he breaks the silence. I got expelled. Just in case you were wondering. I turned to him quickly, my heart racing. What? Yep. Sure did. He shrugs his shoulders. I'm so sorry. I should have asked earlier. I thought for sure Ken could get his son out of this mess. I'm devastated for him. It's okay. You were otherwise occupied with set and plans. For Seattle, remember? I sit on the edge of the bed as far from him as possible, and try my best to bite my tongue. It's a wasted effort. I was trying to find out about the charges against you. He says he's still, he interrupts me with his eyebrows raised in mockery. I heard him. I was there, remember? Hardin, I've had enough of your attitude. I know you're upset, but you need to stop being so disrespectful. I speak slowly, hoping the words sink in. He's dumbfounded for a moment but he quickly recovers. Excuse me? I try to keep the most neutral, if stern, expression I can manage. You heard me, stop talking to me like that. 
I'm sorry, I get kicked out of school, then find you with him, then learn you're going to Seattle. I'd say I'm entitled to be a little angry. Yes, you are, but you aren't entitled to be a jerk. I was hoping we could actually talk about this and work it out like adults for once. What's that supposed to mean? He sits up, but I keep my distance. It means that after six months of this back and forth, I thought we could possibly solve a problem without one of us leaving or breaking things. Six months? His jaw drops. Yes, six months. Awkwardly, I avoid his eyes. Well, since we met. I hadn't realized it's been that long. Well, it has. It feels like a lifetime to me. It doesn't feel like that long is that a problem for you? We've been seeing each other too long? I finally meet his green eyes. No, Tessa, it's just odd to think about, I guess. I've never been in an actual relationship, so six months is a long time. Well, we haven't been dating the entire time. Most of it was spent fighting or avoiding one another I remind him. How long, exactly, were you with Noah? His question surprises me. We've had a few talks regarding my relationship with Noah, but they usually last less than five minutes, ending abruptly because of Hardin's jealousy. We were best friends, since I can remember, but only started dating halfway through high school. I think we'd basically been dating before then, but we just didn't realize it. I watch Hardin with careful eyes, waiting for a reaction. Talking about Noah makes me miss him, not in a romantic way, but in that way you miss your family after not seeing them for an extended period. Oh. He rests his hands in his lap, making me want to reach across and hold them. Did you fight? Sometimes. Our fights were over things like what movie to watch, or him being late to pick me up. He doesn't look up from his hands. Not like we fight, then. I don't think anyone fights like we do. I smile in an attempt to reassure him. What else did you do? With him, I mean, he says, and I swear that sitting in Hardin's place on the bed there is now a small child, green eyes bright, hands nearly shaking. I give a gentle shrug. We didn't do much, really, outside of studying and watching hundreds of movies. We were more like best friends, I guess. You loved him, the child reminds me. Not the way that I love you, I tell him, just like I have countless times before. Would you have given up Seattle for him? He picks at the rough skin around his fingernails. When he looks at me, his insecurity shines through his eyes. So this is why we're talking about Noah. Hardin's low self-esteem has once again taken his thoughts there, to that place where he compares himself to whatever or whomever he thinks that I need. No. Why not? I reach for his hand, to comfort the childlike worry inside of him. Because I shouldn't have to choose at all, and he always knew about my plans and dreams, so I wouldn't have had to choose. I don't have anything in Seattle. He sighs. Me you'd have me. That's not enough. Oh I turn away from him. I know that's fucked up, but it's true. I have nothing there, and you'll have this new job, and you'll make new friends, you'd have a new job too. Christian said he'd give you a job, and we would make new friends together. I don't want to work for him, and the people you choose as friends are more than likely not going to be the same people I would choose. It would just be so different out there. You don't know that. I'm friends with Steph. Only because you were roommates. I don't want to move there, Tessa, especially now that I've been expelled. It makes more sense for me to just go back to England and finish university there. This shouldn't only be about what makes sense for you. Considering that you went behind my back and saw Zed yet again, you aren't exactly in any position to be calling the shots. Really? Because you and I haven't even established that we're together again. I agree to move back in, and you agree to treat me better. I stand up from the bed and begin to pace across the concrete floor. But you went behind my back and beat him up, resulting in your expulsion, so if anyone isn't in a position to call the shots, it's you. You were hiding this from me. He raises voice. You've been planning to leave me and didn't tell me. I know. I'm sorry for that, but instead of arguing over who's the most wrong here, why don't we try to fix it or come to some sort of compromise? You he stops and stands up from the bed. You don't what? I press. I don't know. I can't even think straight 
because of how mad I am at you. I'm sorry for you finding out that way, but I don't know what else to say. Say that you won't go. I'm not making that choice right now. I shouldn't have to. When then? I won't wait around. What are you going to do, then, leave? What happened to I never wish to be parted from you from this day on? Really? You're going to bring that up? You don't think an ideal time to bring up Seattle would be before I got a fucking tattoo for you? The irony isn't lost on me. He steps closer to me, challenging me. I was going to. But you didn't. How many times are you going to mention that? We can go back and forth all day, but I really don't have the energy. I'm over it, I say. Over it? You're over it? He half laughs. Yes, over it. It's true, I'm over fighting with him about Seattle. It's suffocating and frustrating, and I've had just about enough. He grabs a black sweatshirt from the closet and pulls it over his head before slipping his boots onto his feet. Where are you going? I demand. Away from here, he huffs. Harden, you don't have to leave, I call as he opens the door, but he ignores me. If my father wasn't in the living room, I chase after him and force him to stay. But honestly, I'm tired of chasing him. Chapter 7. Harden. Tess's father is awake now, sitting on the couch with his arms crossed in front of his chest and staring blankly out the window. Do you need a ride somewhere? I ask him. I'm not thrilled with the idea of taking him anywhere, but I sure as hell despise the idea of leaving him alone with her. He snaps his head my direction as if startled. Um, yeah, is that okay, he asks. Yeah, I quickly answer. Okay, I just want to say goodbye to Tessie. He looks toward our bedroom. Fine. I'll be in the car. I head out the door, unsure of exactly where I'm going, after I drop the old fool off, but I know it's not good for either of us, if I stay here. I'm so angry with myself. I know she's not the only one to blame here, but I'm used to lashing out at people, and she's always with me, making her an easy target. Which makes me a pathetic motherfucker, I know. I keep my eyes trained on the entrance to our apartment building, waiting for Richard. If he doesn't come soon, I'll leave his ass here. But then I sigh at the thought, since I really don't want to leave him here with her. At last, the father of the year steps through the door and pulls down the sleeves of his shirt. I had expected him to wear the clothes of mine that Tessa gave him, but he's dressed in his clothes from yesterday, only now they're clean. Damn Tessa, she's too fucking nice. I turn the volume up on the radio as he opens the passenger door, hoping that the music will halt any conversation he might try to make. No luck. She's said to tell you to be careful, he says as soon as he gets in, then buckles his seatbelt like he's trying to show me how to do it. Like he's a airline hostess. I give him a small nod and pull onto the street. How did your meeting go today, he asks. Really? I raise my brow at him. Just wondering. He taps his fingers on his leg. I'm glad she went with you. Okay. She seems to be a lot like her mother. I shoot a look at him. The hell she is. She's nothing like that woman. Is he trying to get himself thrown out onto the highway? He laughs. The good qualities only, of course. She's very headstrong, just like Carol. She wants what she wants, but Tessie is much sweeter gentler. Here we go with the Tessie bullshit again. I heard the two of you fighting. It woke me up. I roll my eyes. Excuse us for waking you up at noon, while you were sleeping on our couch. Again, I'm met with a chuckle. I get it, man, you're angry at the world. I was too. Hell, I still am. But when you find someone who's willing to put up with your shit, you don't have to be so angry anymore. Well, old timer. What do you suggest I do, when your daughter is the one making me so goddamn angry? Look, I'll admit you aren't as bad as I thought you were, but I didn't ask for your advice, so don't waste your time giving it to me. I'm not giving you advice, I'm speaking from experience here. I'd hate to see the two of you end things. We aren't ending things, dick. I'm just trying to get my point across. I want to be with her, and I will be, she just needs to give in and come with me. I'm beyond fucking angry that she'd bring Zed into this shit again, regardless of her reasoning. I turn the damn radio off. You don't even know me or her, for that matter. 
Why would you care? Because I know you're good for her. Do you? I reply, sarcasm in full bloom. Thankfully we're getting closer to his side of town, so this horrid conversation will be ending soon. Yes, I do. Then it strikes me, and I'll never admit it to anyone, but it's actually sort of nice to have someone say I'm good for her, even if it's her drunk asshole of a father. I'll take it. Are you going to be seeing her again? I ask, and then quickly add, and where exactly am I taking you? Just drop me near the shop where we met yesterday, I'll figure it out from there. And yes, I hope to be seeing her again. I have a lot of shit to make up for. Yeah, you do, I agree. The parking lot next to the tattoo parlor is empty, which makes some sense, since it's not even one in the afternoon yet. Can you drive me to the end of this street? He asks. I nod and pass the shop. The only thing at the end of this street is a bar and a rundown laundromat. Thanks for the ride. Yep. Do you want to come inside? Richard asks, nodding toward the small bar. Getting a drink with Tessa's homeless drunk father doesn't sound like the most intelligent thing to do at the moment. However, I'm not known for making good decisions. Fuck it, I mumble and turn the car off and follow him inside. It's not like I had anywhere in mind to go anyway. The bar is dark and smells like mold and whiskey. Following him to the small counter, I grab a stool, leaving an empty seat between us. A middle-aged woman wearing what I pray are her teenage daughter's clothes walks toward us. Without a word she slides Richard a small glass filled with whiskey and ice. And for you, she asks me, her voice raspy and deeper than mine. Same as him. Tessa's voice warning me not to do this as clear as a bell between my ears. I push it away, push her away. I raise the glass, and we toast, and each take a sip. How can you afford to be a drunk, if you don't work? I ask. I clean the place every other day, so I drink for free. Shame is clear in his voice. Why not be sober and get paid, then? I don't know. I tried and tried. He stares at his glass with hooded eyes, and for a second they resemble mine. I can see a shadow of myself in them. I'm hoping now it'll get easier if I can see my daughter more often. I nod, not even bothering to hit him with a snide remark, and instead wrap my fingers around the cool glass. I welcome the familiar burn of scotch as I tip my head back and finish the rest. When I push it across the semi-polished bar top, the woman makes eye contact, and then starts pouring me another. Chapter 8. Tessa. Your dad? Landon says incredulously through the phone. I forgot that I hadn't had a chance to tell him about my father's return. Yeah, we ran into him yesterday, how is he? What did he say? What was it like? He's I don't know why, but I feel embarrassed to tell Landon that my father is still drinking. I know he'd never judge me, but I'm still apprehensive. Is he still yeah, he is. He was drunk when we saw him, but we brought him back here, and he stayed the night. I twirl a lock of hair around my index finger. Harden let him? He didn't have a say in it. It's my place too, I snap. But then I immediately feel bad and apologize. I'm sorry, I've just had it with Harden thinking he controls everything. Tessa, do you want me to leave campus and come over? Landon so kind, you can hear it in how he talks. No, I'm just being dramatic. I sigh and look around the bedroom. I think I'll come there, actually. I can still make my last class. I could really use some yoga right about now, and some coffee. I listen to Landon as I dress myself for yoga. It seems like a waste to drive all the way to campus for one class, but I don't want to sit around this apartment and wait for Hardin to come home from wherever he ran off to. Professor Soto asked about your absence today, and Ken said he wrote a character witness statement for Hardin. What's up with that, he asks. Soto did? I don't know he offered to help him before, but I didn't think he meant it. I guess he just likes him or something. Likes him? Likes Hardin? Landon laughs, and I can't help but join him. My phone drops into the sink as I pull my hair into a ponytail. I curse at myself and get it back to my ear just in time to hear Landon say he's headed to the library before his next class. After our goodbyes, I hang up and start to text Hardin to let him know where I'll be but then I close the app instead. 
He'll come around about this whole Seattle thing, he has to. By the time I get to school, the wind has picked up yet again, and the sky has turned an ugly shade of gray. After grabbing a coffee, I still have 30 minutes before yoga. The library is on the other side of campus, so I don't have time to go there and see Landon. Instead I end up waiting outside Professor Soto's classroom. His class should be ending any, my thoughts are cut off by the crowd of students practically rushing out the doors and into the hall. I lift my bag farther up my shoulder and push my way through them to get inside. The professor is standing with his back turned toward me as he pulls his leather jacket over his arms. When he turns, he greets me with a smile. Ms. Young. Hi Professor Soto. What brings you by? Did you need the topic for today's journal that you missed? No, Landon gave it to me already. I came by to thank you. I shift uncomfortably on the heels of my gym shoes. For what? Writing that character witness statement for Hardin. I know he hasn't been that pleasant to you, so it's very appreciated. It's nothing, really. Everyone deserves a quality education, even hotheads. He laughs. I guess so. I smile at him and look around the classroom, unsure what to say next. Besides, Zed deserved what he got, anyway, he says suddenly. What? I look back at him. What do you mean? Professor Soto blinks a few times before collecting himself. Nothing, I'm just I'm sure Hardin had a good reason for going after him, that's all. I better get going, I have a meeting to get to, but thanks for coming by. I'll see you in class Wednesday. I won't be here Wednesday, I'm going on a trip. With a light hand he waves this off. Well, have fun, then. I'll see you when you return. He quickly walks off, leaving me bewildered by what he could have meant. Chapter 9. Hardin. My unlikely drinking partner, Richard, has escaped to the restroom for the fourth time since we've arrived. I get the feeling that Betsy the bartender may take and have a slight liking toward the man, which makes me really fucking uncomfortable. Another, she asks. With a nod, I dismiss the burly woman. It's now after two in the afternoon, and I've had four drinks, which wouldn't be so bad if they weren't straight scotch with a smidgen of ice. My thoughts are cloudy, and my anger has yet to subside. I don't know who or what to be more mad about, so I've given up on reasoning things out and have decided to just run with a general state of piss the fuck off. Here you go. The bartender slides my drink in front of me as Richard takes the stool directly next to me. I was under the impression he understood the importance of the empty stool between us. Guess not. He turns to me, raking his hand over the rough whiskers of his beard. The sound is disgusting. Did you order me another? You should shave that. I offer my somewhat intoxicated opinion. This. He does that thing with his hand again. Yes, that. It's not a good look, I say. It's okay, keeps me warm. He laughs, and I take a drink to stop myself from joining him. Betsy, he calls. She nods and pulls his empty glass from the counter. Then he looks at me. Are you going to tell me what it is you're drinking over? Nope. I move my scotch in a circle, causing the solitary ice cube to clink against the glass. Fine. No questions, then. Only booze he says with some glee. My hatred toward him has dissolved for the most part. That is, until I picture the blonde ten-year-old girl hiding in her mum's greenhouse. Her blue-gray eyes are wide, fearful almost and then the blonde boy in the fucking cardigan shows up to save the day. One question, he presses, jarring me from my thoughts. I take a deep breath and an even deeper drink to keep myself from doing something idiotic. I mean, more idiotic than drinking with my girlfriend's alcoholic father. This family and their fucking questions. One, I say. Did you really get kicked out of college today? I look over at the neon Pabst sign, thinking over the question, wishing I hadn't had four no, five drinks. No. But she thinks I did, I admit. And why does she think that? Nosy fucker. Because I told her that I did. I swing my gaze to him and say with dead eyes, that's enough confessions for one night. Have it your way. He smiles and raises his glass to hit mine, but I pull away, shaking my head. I can tell by his laughter that he hadn't expected me to toast with him anyway, 
and he finds me very amusing, the same way that I find him very annoying. A woman around his age appears at his side and takes the stool next to him. She wraps her thin arm around his shoulder and he greets her warmly. She doesn't strike me as the homeless type, but she obviously knows him. He probably spends the majority of his time in this shithole of a bar. I use this distraction to check my phone for messages or calls from Tessa, nothing. I'm relieved but annoyed that she hasn't attempted to talk to me. Relieved because I'm drunk, but annoyed because I miss her already. Each glass of scotch that slides down my throat makes me want her more makes the hollowness of her absence grow. Fuck, what has she done to me? She's so damn infuriating, always trying to push my buttons. It's like she literally sits around and devises new ways to enrage me. Matter of fact, she probably does. She's probably sitting cross-legged on the bed with that stupid fucking planner on her lap, a pen between her teeth and another behind her ear, coming up with things to do or say that will drive me insane. Six months we've been together now, six months. That's a long ass time, longer than I ever thought I could stand to spend with one person. Granted, we haven't been dating the entire time, and a lot of those months were spent, no, wasted, with my trying to stay away from her. Richard's voice breaks my thoughts. This is Nancy. I nod at the woman and stare back down at the dark wood of the bar top. Nancy, this well-mannered young man is Hardin. He's Tessie's boyfriend, he proudly says. Why would he be proud of me dating his daughter? Tessie has a boyfriend. Is he here? I'd love to finally meet her. Richard here has told me so much about her. She isn't here, I grumble. That's too bad. How did her birthday party go? It was last weekend, right? She asks. What? Richard looks to me, clearly imploring me to go along with some lie he's obviously told. Yeah. It was nice, he answers for me, before gulping down the rest of his drink. That's nice, Nancy says, then points toward the entrance. Oh, there she is. My eyes dart to the door, and for a moment I think she's talking about Tessa, but that wouldn't make sense. She's never met her. Instead a two thin blonde walks across the small room and over to us. This dive bar is getting too damn crowded. I hold my empty glass in the air. Another. After an eye roll and a whispered asshole, I'm given another drink. This is my daughter, Shannon, Nancy informs me. Shannon looks me up and down with eyes that appear to have spiders stuck to them. This chick is wearing way too much makeup. Shannon, this is Hardin. Richard speaks, but I don't make any motion toward greeting her. Many months ago I probably would have paid at least a little attention to the desperate girl. I maybe would have even let her blow me in the disgusting bathroom here, but now I just want her to stop fucking staring at me. I don't think it'll go any lower without taking it off, I say regarding the obnoxious way she keeps tugging at the hem of her shirt to show off the small bit of cleavage she can manage. Excuse me, she huffs, placing her hands on her narrow hips. You heard me. Okay, okay. Let's all just settle down here, Richard says, putting his hands in the air. With that, Nancy and her slutty daughter walk away to find a table. You're welcome, I say to him, but he shakes his head. You're an unpleasant son of a bitch. Before I can react, he adds, just how I like him. Three drinks later, I can barely sit on the bar stool. Richard, who obviously drinks for a living, literally, appears to have the same problem, as he's leaning way too close to me. So then when I get out the next day, I had to walk two miles, of course it started raining he continues on, telling me about the last time he was arrested. I continue to drink and pretend that he isn't talking to me. If I'm supposed to keep your secret, you should at least tell me what well, you told Tessie you were expelled, he says at last. I somehow knew he would wait until I was full on drunk to bring this up again. It's easier if she thinks that, I admit. How's that? Because I want her to go to England with me and she isn't exactly thrilled with the idea. I don't get it. He pinches the bridge of his nose. Your daughter wants to leave me, and I can't let that happen. So you tell her you got kicked out of school, so she'll go to England? Basically. He looks down at his drink, then over at me. That's really stupid. I know. And it does sounds really fucking stupid when spoken out loud, 
but it somehow makes sense inside my fucked up head. Who are you to give advice to me, anyway? I say to him at last. No one. All I'm saying is you'll end up just like me, if you keep it up. I want to tell him to fuck off and mind his own damn business, but when I look up at him, I see the resemblance I noted when we first sat down at the bar. Fuck. Don't tell her, I remind him. I won't. Then he turns to Betsy. Another round. She smiles at him and begins to make our drinks. I don't think I can handle another. I'm good. Right now you have three eyes, I tell him. He shrugs. More for me. I'm a shit boyfriend, I think to myself, wondering what Tessie, fuck, Tessa, is doing right now. I'm a shit father, Richard says. I'm too drunk to comprehend the difference between thinking and speaking, so I don't know if him saying this is coincidence or I was speaking out loud, move down, a gruff male voice says to the left of Richard. I glance over to see a short man with an even fuller beard than my drinking companions. There aren't any more stools, partner, Richard replies slowly. Well, then you better move, the man threatens. Fuck, not this. Not now. We aren't moving. I dismiss the man. The man who then makes the mistake of grabbing Richard by the collar and roughly yanking him upright. Chapter 10. Tessa. The walk back to my car after yoga feels much longer than usual. The heaviness of Hardin's expulsion and the move to Seattle were lifted from me during meditation, but now, outside the walls of the classroom, the weight is back and multiplied by 10. As soon as I begin to pull out of the parking spot, my phone vibrates on the passenger seat. Hardin. Hello? I stop and shift the gear into park. But it's a woman's voice that barks through the speaker, and my heart stops. Is this Tessa? Yes. Good, I've got your father and her boyfriend I hear hard and groan in the background. Yeah, your boyfriend, she says snidely. I'm gonna need you to pick these two up before someone calls the cops. Calls the cops? Where are they? I shift back into drive. Dizzy's on Lamar Avenue. You know the place? No, but I'll Google it. Ha. Huh. Of course you will. Ignoring her attitude, I hang up the phone and hastily get directions to the bar. Why the hell are Hardin and my father at a bar at 3 in the afternoon? Why the hell are Hardin and my father even together? This makes no sense to me, and what about the cops? What did they do? I should have asked the woman on the phone. I can only hope they didn't get into a fight with each other. That's the last thing any of us needs. My imagination has run wild by the time I make it to the bar and has concluded that Hardin's either murdered my father or vice versa. There are no cop cars outside the small bar, which is a good sign, I suppose. I park directly in front of the building and hurry inside, wishing I had worn a sweatshirt instead of a t-shirt. There she is, my father calls out jubilantly. I can tell he's loaded as he stumbles over to me. You should have seen it, Tessie. He claps his hands. Hardin just whoops some serious ass. Where is he? I start, but right then a bathroom door opens and Hardin walks out, wiping his bloody hands on a red stained paper towel. What happened? I yell to him from the opposite side of the room. Nothing calm down. I give as I walk over to him. Are you drunk? I ask, then twist slightly to look at his eyes, bloodshot. He looks off to the side. Maybe. This is unbelievable. I cross my arms as he tries to take my hand. Hey, you should be thanking me for having your dad's back. He'd be on the floor right now, if it wasn't for me. He points to a man sitting on the floor holding a bag of ice against his cheek. I won't be thanking you for anything, you're drunk in the middle of the afternoon. And with my father, of all people. What the hell is wrong with you? I storm away from him, back toward the bar where my father is now sitting. Don't be mad at him, Tessie. He loves you. My father is defending him. What the hell is going on here? As Hardin walks over, I ball my fists at my sides and shout, so what, you two get wrung together and now you're best friends? Neither of you should even be drinking. Baby, Hardin says into my ear and attempts to wrap his arm around me. Hey the woman behind the bar says, knocking on the counter to get my attention. You gotta get them out of here. I nod at her and glare at the drunken idiots who are my lot. 
my father's cheek is pink, giving the impression he was hit, and Hardin's hands are already swelling. You can come to our house for tonight so you can sober up, but this isn't acceptable behavior. I want to scold them both, like the children they are. For either of you. I exit the smelly little space and am at the car before they make it to the door. Hardin scowls at my father as the older man tries to rest an arm on his shoulder. I get into my car, disgusted. Hardin's intoxication puts me on edge. I know how he is when he's drunk, and I'm not sure I've ever seen him this drunk before, not even that night he destroyed all the china. I miss the days when Hardin didn't drink anything but water at parties. We have a list of problems right now, and him drinking only adds fuel to the flames. Apparently, my father has graduated from being an angry drunk to one who tells endless jokes, most of which are tasteless and obnoxious. The whole ride home he laughs too hard at his own words, with Hardin joining him every now and then. This isn't how I envision this day at all. I don't know what it was that made Hardin warm up to my father, but now that they're both drunk in the middle of the day, I don't like their friendship at all. When we get home, I leave my father in the kitchen eating more of Hardin's frosted flakes and head for the bedroom, where most of our arguments seem to begin and end. Tessa, Hardin begins as soon as I close the door. Don't, I say coldly. Don't be mad at me, we were just having a drink. His tone is playful, but I'm not in the mood for it. Just having a drink? With my father, an alcoholic who I'm trying to build a relationship with, who I wanted to maybe think about getting sober. That's who you were just drinking with? Baby I shake my head. Don't you baby me. I'm not okay with this. Nothing happened. He wraps his fingers around my arm to pull me to him, but when I pull away it causes him to stumble to the bed. Hardin, you got in a fight again. Not a big one. Who cares? I do. I care. He looks up at me from his place on the edge of our bed, his green eyes laced with red, and says, then why are you leaving me? If you care so much? My heart sinks a little farther into my chest. I'm not leaving you. I'm asking you to come with me. I sigh. But I don't want to, he whines. I know, but this is the one thing I have left, apart from you, of course. I'll marry you. He reaches for my hand, but I step back. My breath hitches. I'm sure I couldn't have heard that correctly. What? I raise my hands, blocking him from coming closer. I said I'll marry you, if you choose me. He stands up, stepping toward me. The words, even though they're meaningless, because of the amount of alcohol coursing through him, still excite me. You're drunk, I say. He's only offering marriage because he's drunk, which is worse than not offering at all. So? I still mean it. No, you don't. I shake my head and dodge his touch again. Yes, I do, not now, of course, but in like six years or so. He scratches his thumb across his forehead, thinking. I roll my eyes. Despite my fluttering heart, this last bit of hedging, offering to marry me in a vague six years or so, shows that reality is creeping back into his thoughts, even as he drunkenly tries to convince me otherwise. We'll see how you feel about this tomorrow, I say, knowing he surely won't remember it tomorrow. Will you be wearing those pants? His lips form a wicked smile. No, don't even start talking about these damn pants. You're the one who wore them. You know how I feel about them. He looks down at his lap, then points at it, and looks up waggling his eyebrows. Playful, teasing, drunk heart and is sort of adorable, but not adorable enough to make me lose my ground. Come here, he begs, mock frowning. No. I'm still upset with you. Come on, Tessie, don't be mad. He laughs and rubs his eyes with the back of his hands. If either of you calls me that one more time, I swear, Tessie, what's wrong, Tessie? Do you don't like the name Tessie, Tessie? Hardin grins wide, and I feel my resolve fading the longer I stare at him. Are you going to let me take those pants off of you? No. I've a lot to do today, and none of those things involve you taking my clothes off. I would ask you to come along, but you decided to get wasted with my father, so I have to go alone. You're going somewhere? His voice is smooth yet raspy, thick from the liquor. Yes. You're not wearing that, though, right? Yes, I am. 
I can wear whatever the hell I want to wear. I grab a sweatshirt and head for the door. I'll be back later, don't do anything stupid, because I won't bail you or my father out of jail. Sassy. I like it, but I can think of something else to do with that smart mouth of yours. When I ignore his crude remark, he coos, stay with me. I quickly leave the room in the apartment, before he can persuade me to stay. I hear him call Tessie as I reach the door, and have to cover my mouth, to hide the giggle that escapes. This is my problem, when it comes to Harden, my brain doesn't see the difference between right and wrong. Chapter 11. Tessa. By the time I make it to my car, I already wish I'd have stayed in the bedroom with Harden and his playful mood. But I have too much to do. I have to call the woman back about the apartment in Seattle, get a few things for the trip with Harden's family, and, most importantly, clear my head about Seattle. Harden offering me marriage nearly swayed me, but I know he won't mean it tomorrow. I'm trying desperately not to overthink his words and let them change my mind, but it's much harder than I expected. I'll marry you, if you choose me. I was surprised, shocked, really, when the words were spoken. He seemed so calm, his voice so neutral, as if he were announcing what we were having for dinner. I know better, though. I know he's getting desperate. The liquor and his desperation, to keep me from moving to Seattle, are the only reasons behind his offer. Even so, I can't stop replaying the words in my mind. Pathetic, I know, but if I'm being honest, that mix of hopefulness and knowing better than to feel that way is how I feel. By the time I get to Target, I still haven't called Sandra, I believe that's her name, to discuss the apartment. It looks like a nice place from the pictures on the website. Not nearly as big as our current space, but it's good enough and I can afford to live there on my own. It doesn't have bookshelves for walls, or the exposed brick wall that I have grown to love so much, but it'll do. I'm ready for this, for Seattle. I'm ready to take this step for my future. I've been waiting for this, since I can remember. I stroll through the store, daydreaming about Seattle and my situation, and soon I find my basket full of random things, none of which I actually need for the trip. Tablets for the dishwasher, toothpaste, a new dustpan. Why am I buying this, if I'm moving anyway? I put the dustpan back, along with some colorful socks I tossed in there for no apparent reason. If Hardin doesn't come along, I'll need to start over and buy all new dishes, all new everything. It's a huge relief that the apartment comes furnished, since that crosses out at least a dozen things from my to-do list. After Target, I'm not really sure what to do with myself. I don't want to return to the apartment with Hardin and my father, but I don't have anywhere else to go. I'm going to be spending three days with Landon, Ken, and Karen, so I don't want to drive to their house and bother them. I really need friends. Or one friend, at least. I could call Kimberly, but she's probably busy planning her own move. Lucky girl. It's Christian's company that's taking her to Seattle, granted but I can tell by the way he looks at her, that he'd follow her anywhere. While scrolling through my phone to call Sandra, I almost tap Steph's name. I wonder what she's doing. Hardin would probably lose his mind, if I called her to hang out. Then again, he's in no position, to tell me what to do, being completely belligerent, and wasted in the middle of the day. I'm calling her, I decide. And she answers quickly. Tessa. What are you up to? she says loudly, trying to talk over the voices in the background. Nothing. I'm sitting in the parking lot at Target. Oh, fun shit, then? She laughs. Not really. What are you doing? Nothing, going to lunch with my friend. Oh, okay. Well, call me later or something I say. You can meet us there if you want, it's just the Applebee's right off campus. Applebee's reminds me of said but the food was incredible, and I haven't eaten yet today. Okay, I'll come if you're sure that's okay? I ask. I hear a car door shut in the background. Yes. Get your ass over here. We'll be there in about 15 minutes or so. I call Sandra on my way back toward campus and leave her a voicemail. I can't ignore the relief that I feel when her voicemail picks up instead of her actual voice, but I'm not really sure what that's about. Applebee's is really crowded by the time I arrive, and I don't see Steph as I scan the room for bright crimson hair, 
So I put my name in with the hostess. How many? The hostess asks me with a friendly smile. Three, I think. Steph said she was with her friend, so I assume she meant only one person. Well, I've got a booth available now, so let me give it to you just in case. The girl smiles and grabs four menus from the stand behind her. I follow her to the booth toward the back of the restaurant and wait for Steph to arrive. I check my phone for any correspondence from Hardin, but there's none. He's probably passed out by now. When I look back up, my adrenaline immediately spikes at the sight of flaming pink hair. Chapter 12. Hardin. I open the cabinet in search of something to eat. I need to soak up the liquor coursing through me. She's so mad at us, Richard says, watching me. Yeah, she is. I can't help but smile at the way her face was flushed with anger, her small fists bunched at her sides. She was furious. It's not funny well, it is, but it shouldn't be. Is my daughter one to hold grudges? I look at him for a minute. It's weird for a father to have to ask a boyfriend about his own daughter's habits. Obviously not. You're in our kitchen eating all my damn cereal. I shake the empty box. He smiles. Guess you're right, he says. Yeah, usually am. Actually, that couldn't be further from the fucking truth. Guess it sucks for you that you showed up now, when she's moving in less than a week, I say as I place a Tupperware container in the microwave. I'm not exactly sure what's in it, but I'm starving, and too drunk to cook for myself, and Tessa isn't here to cook for me. What the fuck am I going to do when she leaves me? It does, he says with a grimace. I'm just glad Seattle isn't too far. England is. After a long pause, he says, she won't go to England. I give him a fuck off look. What the fuck do you know? You've known her for, what, two days? I'm about to really go off when the obnoxious beep of the microwave interrupts us. I know Carol, though, and she wouldn't go to England. So he's back to being the annoying drunk he was yesterday. Tessa isn't her mother, and I'm not you. Okay, he says and shrugs. Chapter 13. Tessa. Molly. I pray that her presence here is a complete coincidence, but when Steph appears behind her, I sink back into the booth. Hey Tessa. Steph says and sits across from me, scooting him close to the wall, so her friend can sit next to her. Why would she invite me to have lunch with her and Molly? Long time no see, Molly the skank says to me. I don't know what to say to either of them. I want to get up and walk out, but instead I half smile and just say, yeah. Have you ordered? Steph asks, completely ignoring the fact that she brought with her my biggest, my only, enemy. No. I reach into my bag to pull out my phone. No need to call daddy, I'm not going to bite. Molly smirks. I wasn't calling Hardin, I tell her. I was actually going to text him, there's a clear difference. Sure you weren't, she replies, and laughs. Stop, Steph snaps. You said you'd be nice, Molly. Why did you even come? I asked the girl that I loathe more than anyone in the entire world. She shrugs. I'm hungry, she says matter-of-factly, clearly mocking my emotions. I grab my sweatshirt and move to get up. I should just go. No, stay. Please, you're moving, and I won't see you again, Steph says, pouting. What? You're leaving in a few days, aren't you? Who told you that? Molly and Steph look at each other before Steph answers. Said, I think, it doesn't matter, though. I thought you'd tell me. I was going to. There was just a lot going on. I was going to tell you here I say, then look at Molly, as if to explain my reluctance to continue. I still wish you'd have told me. I was your first friend here. Steph sticks out her bottom lip in a way that makes me feel bad, but still seems a little comical so I'm thankful when a server arrives to take our drink order. While Steph and Molly are ordering their sodas, I text Hardin. You're probably passed out, but I'm at lunch with Steph, and she brought Molly I hit send and look back up at the two girls. So, are you excited to be leaving? What are you and Hardin going to do? Steph asks. I shrug and look around the room. I'm not discussing my relationship in front of Satan's daughter. You can talk in front of me. Trust me, I'm not interested in your boring ass life, Molly scoffs, 
taking a sip of her water. Trust you? I laugh, and my phone vibrates. Come home. Hardin texts back. I don't know what I expected him to say, but I'm disappointed in his advice, or lack of it. No, I'm hungry. I reply. Look, you and Hardin are cute and all, but I don't really give a shit about your relationship anymore, Molly informs me. I have my own relationship to worry about now. Great. Good for you. I feel bad for whoever the idiot is. Speaking of which, Molly, when are we going to meet this mystery man? Steph asks her friend. Molly dismisses her with a flip of the hand. I don't know. Not right now. The waitress returns with our drinks and takes our orders. As soon as she leaves, Molly turns to me, her real prey. Anyway, so how pissed it said, are you that he's planning to put Hardin in jail, she asks, and I nearly spit out my water. The idea of Hardin going to jail sends ice through my veins. I'm trying to stop that from happening. Good luck with that. Unless you plan on fucking Zed, there's nothing you can do. Again she smirks, tapping her neon green fingernail on the table. That's not an option, I growl. I've got something you can eat here. Really, though, come home before something happens, and I can't save you. Save me? From what? Molly and Steph? Steph is my friend, and I've already proved once before that I can take Molly, and I do it again in a heartbeat. She's annoying and I can't stand her, but I'm not afraid of her like I once was. I can tell by Hardin's perverted message that he's still intoxicated. I mean it, leave there, his next message says when I don't reply. I shove my phone into my bag and direct my attention to the girls. You've already done it before, so what's the difference? Molly says. Excuse me? I say. I'm not judging you. I fucked Hardin. Zed too, she reminds me. I'm so frustrated that I want to scream. I didn't sleep with Zed, I say through my teeth. M.M. Molly says, and Steph glares at her. Did someone say that, that I slept with Zed? I ask them. No, Steph answers before Molly can speak. And anyway, enough talk about Zed. I want to know about Seattle. Is Hardin coming too? Yeah, I lie. I don't want to admit especially in front of Molly, that Hardin refuses to join me in Seattle. So neither of you will be here anymore? That will be so strange, Steph says with a little frown. It'll be strange to start over at a new campus, after everything I've been through at WCU. That's exactly what I need, though, a new start. This entire town is tainted with memories of betrayal and false friendships. We should have a get-together this weekend, one last hurrah, Steph says. I groan. No, no parties. No, no, not a party, just our group. She looks at me with something like pleading in her eyes. Let's be honest, we'll probably never see each other again, and Hardin should hang out with his old friends at least one more time. I hesitate and have to look away from her, glancing over at the bar area. Molly's voice interrupts the silence. I won't be there, don't worry. I look back at them and right then our food arrives. But I've lost my appetite. Are people really saying that I slept with Zed? Has Hardin heard this supposed rumor? Will Zed really put Hardin in jail? My head hurts. Steph eats a few fries, and before she finishes chewing she says, talk to Hardin, and let me know. We could have it at someone's apartment, Tristan and Nate's, even. That way no random douch bags will show up. I can ask I don't know if you will or not. My eyes move down to my screen. Three missed calls. One text, answer your phone. I'm leaving after I eat, calm down. Drink some water, I respond and pick up my own fries a little. But the tension obviously gets to Molly, and she starts talking like a pot boiling over. Well, he should like that idea, we were his friends long before you came along and ruined him. I didn't ruin him. Yes, you did. He's so different now, he doesn't even call anybody anymore. His friends, I scoff. Nobody calls him either. The only one who even contacts him anymore is Nate. That's because we know, Molly begins. But Steph puts her hand in the air. Enough, oh my god, she groans, rubbing her temples. I'm going to ask for a takeout box and go home. This was a bad idea, I tell her. 
I don't know what she was thinking bringing Molly here anyway. She could have at least warned me. Steph looks at me sympathetically. I'm sorry Tessa. I thought you guys could get along since she's not trying to fuck with Harden anymore. Then she glares at Molly, who shrugs. We are getting along, better than before, Molly says. I want to smack that smug look off her face. But Steph's ringtone interrupts my violent thoughts. A puzzled look crosses her face. Then she says, it's Harden, he's calling me, and holds her phone up for me to see. I haven't been texting him back. I'll call him in a minute, I tell her, and she nods okay, and ignores the call. Jeez, stalker much? Molly bites down on the end of a french fry. I bite my tongue, and ask the server for a to-go box. I've barely touched my food, but I don't want to cause a scene in the middle of a restaurant. Please think about Saturday. We can even make it like a dinner thing instead of a party, Steph offers. Then she gives me her best smile. Please? I'll see what I can do, but we're going on a trip until Saturday morning. She nods again agreeably. You can choose the time. Thanks. I'll let you know, I tell her, and pay my bill. I don't like the idea, but in a way she's right, we won't ever see any of them again. Hardin's going somewhere, maybe not Seattle, but he isn't staying here now since his expulsion, and he probably should see his old friends one last time. He's calling again, Steph tells me. She doesn't bother trying to hide her amusement. Tell him I'm on my way. I stand up and head for the door. When I turn back around, Steph and Molly are talking, and Steph's phone is resting on the table in front of them. Chapter 14. Harden. Tessa, if you don't call me back, I'll come looking for you, hammered or not, I threaten, then throw my phone against the couch too hard, so it bounces up off the back and hits the concrete. She'll come back, Dick assures me ever so helpfully. I know that. I shout at him, and grab my phone. Fortunately, the screen's not cracked. I glare at the old drunk, and then stalk into the bedroom. Why the fuck is he here, again? And why the fuck isn't Tessa? Nothing good can come out of her being in the same room with Molly. Just as I start plotting how to go out, and find her when I have no keys, no car, and a blood alcohol level that is far beyond the legal limit, I hear the front door open. He's, uh, lying down, Richard says loudly, with incongruous cheerfulness. I suspect he's trying to give me some sort of warning of Tessa's arrival. I pull the door open, before she can, and sweep a long arm to invite her in. She doesn't look the least bit intimidated or concerned by the deep scowl on my face. Why didn't you answer when I called you? I demand because I told you I was leaving soon. And I did. You should have answered. I've been worried. Worried? She's clearly surprised by my choice of words. Yes, worried. Why the hell were you with Molly? She puts her purse on the back of the chair. Beats me. Steph invited me to lunch and brought her along, fucking Steph. Why the fuck would she do that? Was she... mean? No meaner than usual. She raises her brow, watching me. Steph's a bitch for bringing her. What were they saying? I don't know, but I think people are spreading rumors about me. She frowns and sits on the chair to remove her shoes. What? What sort of rumors? What I really mean to ask is, who do I have to kill? Fuck, I'm still drunk. How's this possible? It's been at least three hours. I vaguely remember being told some time ago that each drink takes an hour to sober up from. I'm fucked for at least the next 10 or so hours, then. That is, if I'm remembering correctly. Did you hear me? Tessa's voice is calm, worried even. No, sorry, I mumble. Her cheeks flush. I think people are saying, that said and I you know. Do you what? That we slept together. Her eyes are weary, and her voice is soft. Who's saying that? I try to keep my voice at the same level as Tessa's despite the slow burn of anger building inside me. Supposedly there's a rumor about it. Steph and Molly were talking about it. I don't know whether to try to comfort her or let my anger take over. I'm too drunk for this shit. She holds her hands in her lap and looks down. I don't want people to think of me in that way. Don't listen to them, they're fucking idiots. If there is a rumor, I'll be sure it's cleared up. 
I drag her over to sit with me on the bed. Don't you worry. You're not mad at me? She asks, blue-gray eyes meeting mine. Yes, I say. I'm upset because you weren't answering, and then Steph didn't fucking answer. But I'm not mad about this rumor shit not at you, at least, they probably just made it up because they wanted to be assholes. The thought of Steph and Molly saying shit to Tessa to purposely hurt her feelings really fucking irks me. I don't understand why she brought Molly, who then, of course, had to remind me that she slept with you. She cringes. So do I. She's a fucking whore who doesn't have shit else to do, but reminisce over the days I used to fuck her brains out. Harden, Tess whines at the too descriptive reminder. Sorry, you know what I mean. She unhooks the clasp on her bracelet and gets up to place it on the desk. Are you still drunk? A little. A little? I smile. A little more than a little. You're being so weird. She rolls her eyes and pulls that damn planner out of the desk drawer. How so? I walk over to stand behind her. You're drunk and being all nice about everything. Like you were mad that I wasn't answering you, but now you're being she looks up at my face. Understanding, I guess is the word, over this Molly thing. What did you expect me to do? I don't know yell at me. You don't have the best temper when you're drunk, she says softly. I can tell she's trying not to upset me, but wants to let me know she's not going to dance around the issue. I'm not going to yell at you. I just didn't want you around them. You know how they are, especially Molly, and I don't want anyone hurting you. Then I add, emphasizing each word, in any way. Well, they didn't, but I know it's stupid, but for once I just wanted a normal lunch with a friend. I want to tell her Steph isn't an ideal choice for a friend, but I know she doesn't have any, aside from Landon and me and Noah. And said. Well, not said anymore. That shit is over, and I'm fairly certain, that kid won't be showing his face around here for a while. Chapter 15. Tessa. The fact that Hardin is being reasonable surprises me, and I'm able to relax a little bit. He crosses his legs and leans back on his palms. I'm not sure if I should bring up Seattle now, since he seems to be in an easy mood, or if I should wait. But if I wait, who knows when he'll be ready to talk about it. I glance at him, notice his green eyes watching me, and decide to ease into it. Steph wants to have a going away party, I tell him, and wait for his reaction. Where's she going? LSU? No. It's for me, I explain, leaving out the small detail of telling them he's coming along to Seattle. He gives me a look. You told him you're moving? Yes. Why wouldn't I? Because you haven't decided yet, right? Harden, I'm going to Seattle. He shrugs nonchalantly. You still have some time to think about it. Anyway what do you think about this party? She said it could be a dinner party type get together at Nate and Tristan's place instead of the frat house, I explain, but Harden's still intoxicated, and he doesn't seem to be listening to me. I look over my moving schedule for next week. I really hope Sandra calls me back soon about that apartment, otherwise I won't have a place to live when I get there, and I'll be stuck living out of a suitcase in some motel room. Ugh, motel rooms. No, we aren't going, he surprises me by saying. I turn to him. What? Why not? If it's a dinner it won't be so bad, no truth or dare or suck and go, you know. He chuckles and looks up at me with amusement clear on his face. Suck and blow, Tess. You know what I mean. It'll be the last time we, well, I see them, and they have sort of been my friends, in a really strange way. I don't want to think about the beginning of my friendship with the group. Let's just talk about it later. This shit is giving me a headache, he groans. I sign defeat. I can tell by his tone that he's not going to continue the discussion. Come here. He sits back down on the mattress and opens his arms to me. I close the planner and go to join him on the bed. As I stand between his legs, his hands move to my hips. He looks up at me with a crooked smile. Aren't you supposed to be mad at me or something? I'm getting overwhelmed, Harden I admit. Overwhelmed by what? I throw up my arms. Everything. Seattle, transferring to another campus, Landon leaving, your expulsion I lied he says plainly, and nuzzles his face into my stomach. What now? What? 
I thread my fingers through his hair and lift his head to look up at me. He shrugs. I lied about the expulsion. I take a step away from him, he tries to pull me back, but I don't allow it. Why? I don't know, Tessa he says, and stands. I was upset about you being outside with Seth and all this Seattle shit. My mouth drops. So you told me you were expelled, because you were pissed at me? Yeah. Well, that and another reason. What other reason? He sighs. You're going to be angry. His eyes are still red, but he seems to be sobering up quickly. I cross my arms over my chest. Yeah, probably. But tell me. I thought you'd feel bad for me and come to England. I don't know what to think about his confession. I should be upset. I am upset. I'm pissed the hell off. The nerve of him to try and guilt me into moving to England with him. He should have just been honest from the start, but still I can't help but feel a little better about finding it out straight from his mouth instead of the usual way his lies are revealed. He looks at me with questioning eyes. Tessa I look at him and almost smile. Honestly, I'm just surprised you came clean before someone else told me. Me too. He closes the distance between us, bringing his hand to my neck, the span of his fingers covering my jaw. Please don't be mad at me. I'm an asshole. I blow out a harsh breath, but love his touch. That's a terrible defense. I'm not defending myself. I'm a dick. I know this, but I love you, and I'm sick of all the shit. I knew you'd find out sooner or later anyway, especially with this dreadful trip with my father's family. So you told me, because you knew I'd find out? Yeah. I pull my head back a little, and look at him. You would have kept it from me, and still tried to force me to go to England with you out of pity? Basically what the hell am I supposed to say to that? I want to tell him he's insane, that he's not my father and needs to stop trying to manipulate me but instead I just stand there with my mouth open like a fool. You can't try to force me into things by lying and manipulating me. I know it's fucked up, he says, with a look of worry in his green eyes. I don't know why I am the way I am. I just don't want to lose you, and I'm desperate here. I can tell by his expression that he really doesn't understand how he's been acting. No, you don't know. Otherwise you wouldn't have lied. Hardin puts his hands on my hips. Tessa, I'm sorry, I really am. You have to admit that we're both getting much better at this relationship shit. He's right, in a messed up way we really are much better at communicating than we used to be. Far from a normal functioning relationship, but normal has never been our thing. So, the marriage thing that isn't going to make you come with me? My heart beats uncontrollably in my chest, and I'm sure he can hear it. But I say simply, we'll talk about it when you're not drunk. I'm not that drunk. I smile and pat his cheek. Too drunk for that type of conversation. He smiles and pulls me closer. When will you be back from Sandpoint? You're not coming? I don't know. You said you would. We've never traveled together before. Seattle, he says, and I laugh. Actually, you showed up there uninvited and left the next morning. He runs a hand through my hair. Technicalities. I really want you to come. Landon is moving soon. The thought of that alone pains me. So, he asks, shaking his head. And your father would love it if you came, I'm sure. Oh, him. He's just upset with himself because they gave me a bullshit fine and put me on academic probation. The slightest fuck up and I'm done. Then why not transfer to the Seattle campus with me? I can't hear the word Seattle again tonight, I've had a long day, and have a headache from hell now he kisses my forehead. I snap my head back slightly, away from him. You got drunk with my father and lied about being expelled, we're talking about Seattle, if I want to, I say sharply. He smiles. And you wore those pants out after teasing me with them, and didn't answer my calls. He runs his thumb along my bottom lip. You don't need to call me that many times. It's suffocating. Molly even called you a stalker, I say, but smile beneath his gentle touch. Did she, now? He continues tracing the outline of my lips, and they part involuntarily. Yeah, I breathe. Hm, I know what you're doing. I reach down and remove his other hand from my hip, where his fingers have begun to slip below the waistband of my pants. He smiles. What's that? 
You're trying to distract me, so I won't be mad at you. How's that working for me? Not well enough. Besides, my father is here, and there's no way I'm having sex with you when he's in the other room. I reach around and smack him playfully on the butt. Which only makes him thrust himself against me a little. Oh, you mean like when I fucked you right there, he points to the bed, while my mum was sleeping on the couch? He thrusts gently against me again. Or the time I fucked you in the bathroom at my father's, or the multiple times I fucked you while Karen, Landon, and my father were just down the hall. He reaches down and touches my thigh softly. Oh, wait, you must mean like when I bend you over your desk at work, okay. Okay. I get it, I get it. I flush, and he laughs. Come on, Tessie, lie down. You're sick. I laugh and step away from him. Where are you going, he says with a pout. To see what my father's doing out there. Why? So you can come back in here and, no. Gosh, go to sleep or something. I exclaim. I'm glad he's still being playful, but despite his confession, it's still annoying that he lied to me and is being so stubborn about even really discussing Seattle. I thought for sure that when I got home from my late lunch at Applebee's, he'd be furious at me for not answering his texts. I never suspected that we'd talk things out and he'd admit to lying about being expelled. Maybe Stafford reassured him that I was on my way, so he had time to calm down. Then again, Steph's phone was on the table, when I turned back around did you say Steph didn't answer when you called? I ask. Yes. Why? He looks at me, confused. I shrug, unsure what to say. I'm just wondering. Why, though? His tone is off. I told her to tell you I was on my way, and I'm just wondering why she didn't. Oh. He looks away, reaching for a cup on the dresser. This whole conversation is so awkward. Steph not telling him that I was on my way, him avoiding my eyes. I'm going out there. You can join us if you want. I will. I'm just going to change. I nod and turn the door handle. What about your dad, though? He just came back into your life, and you're going to leave? His words stopped me in my tracks. It's not like I hadn't thought about it before, but Harden lobbing that question at me like a missile, when my back is turned, doesn't sit right with me. I take a moment to recover, before leaving the room. When I get to the living room, my father is asleep again. Binge drinking at noon must be exhausting. I turn off the television and head to the kitchen for some water. Hardin's words about leaving so soon after seeing my father again keep replaying in my mind. But the thing is, I can't put my future on hold for a father whom I haven't seen for nine years. If the circumstances were different I would consider rethinking this but he's the one who left me. When I get back to the bedroom door, I hear Hardin's voice speaking from inside. What the fuck was that shit today, he says, his voice muffled. I press my ear to the door. I should just walk in, but I get the feeling I'm not supposed to hear the conversation. Which means I really should hear the conversation. I don't give a fuck, it shouldn't have happened. Now she's all upset and shit and you're supposed to I can't make out the rest of the sentence. Don't fuck this up, he snaps. Who is he talking to? And what are they supposed to be doing? Is it Steph? Or, worse, Molly? I hear his footsteps approaching the door, and I quickly scoot into the bathroom and close the door. Moments later, knuckles tap against the wood. Tessa? I open the door. I know I must appear flustered, my heart is pounding against my ribcage, and my stomach is in a knot. Oh, hey. Was just finishing up in here, I say, but my voice too small. Hardin cocks an eyebrow at me. Okay he looks down the hall. Where's your dad? Is he asleep? Uh, yup, I say, which makes him grin wide. Well, come on back to the bedroom, then, he says and takes my hand in his, turning and pulling me gently. As I follow Hardin back into the bedroom, paranoia begins to seep into my thoughts like a familiar friend. Chapter 16. Tessa. The microscopic section of my mind that holds a place for common sense is attempting to send warning signals to the rest of my brain, the space held by Hardin and all things Hardin. The sensible side, what's left of it, anyway, is telling me 
that I need to ask questions, that I can't just brush this off. I do that too much as it is. That's the microscopic section. The larger section wins. Because, do I really want to cause a fight with him, or accuse him of something, that I might just be misunderstanding? He could have just been angry at staff for inviting Molly along to lunch earlier. I couldn't hear all that well, and he might have been sticking up for me. He was just so forthcoming about having lied about being expelled, why would he be lying to me now? Hardin sits back on the bed, grabbing my hands in his, pulling me over to sit on his leg. Well, we've exhausted all the serious topics, and your dad's asleep. I guess we'll have to find another way to occupy ourselves his grin is ridiculous yet infectious. Is sex all you think about? I reply and push his chest playfully. He lies back on the bed, one hand across the small of my back and one behind my thigh, pulling me on top of him. I straddle him, my thighs on either side of his, and he pulls me down, so that our faces are nearly touching. No, I think of other things too. For example, I think of those lips open around me, he brushes his lips against mine. I can taste the hint of mint on his breath when he kisses me, the pressure is hard enough to send a wave of electricity through me, but gentle enough to leave me wanting more. I think of my face buried between your legs while you, he starts to say, but I reach up and cover his mouth with my hand. The way his tongue playfully darts out to lick my palm causes me to pull away quickly. Do you? I crinkle my nose and wipe my wet palm on his black shirt. I'll be quiet, he softly says, lifting his hips from the mattress to press himself against me. That's more than you can say, of course. My father, I remind him, with much less conviction this time. Who gives a fuck? This is our place, and if he doesn't like it, he can leave. I give him a semi-serious look. Don't be rude. I'm not, but I want you and I should be able to have you whenever I want to, he says, and I roll my eyes. I had a say in this too. It's my body you're talking about. I pretend like my heart isn't pounding, and I don't have that familiar ache for him. Obviously, yes. But I know that, if I do this, he reaches his hand down between our bodies, and under the waistband of my pants and panties. See, I knew you'd be ready. When I started talking about eating I press my lips against his to silence his dirty mouth, and he swallows the gasps he's causing me to make as his fingers graze over my clit. He's barely touching me, deliberately trying to torture me. Please, I hiss, and he applies more pressure, pushing a slick finger inside of me. Thought so, he taunts and pumps his finger slowly. All too soon he stops his motion, and moves me to lie beside him. Before I can complain, he sits up and grips the top of my pants, the pair he seems to be so infatuated with, and pulls them roughly down my thighs. I lift my hips to assist him, and then he works off my panties too. Without speaking, he gestures for me to move up toward the top of the bed. I push myself back using my elbows, and rest my back against the headboard. He lies on his stomach in front of me, hooking both arms around my thighs, opening them. He smirks. At least try to be quiet. I begin to roll my eyes, but then his warm breath hits me, soft at first, then increasing in pressure when he gets closer. Without warning, his tongue slides across me, and I reach over and grab a decorative pillow, the yellow one, that Hardin calls hideous on a regular basis. I cover my face with it, using it to muffle the involuntary sounds falling from my lips as his tongue moves faster and faster. Abruptly, the pillow is ripped away from my face. No, baby, watch me, Hardin instructs, and I nod slowly. He brings one thumb to his lips, and his tongue glides over me. Moving his hand back between my thighs, he hits my most sensitive spot. My legs tighten, his touch feels heavenly against my clit, his finger moving in slow circles with just the lightest touch of the tip of his finger torturing me. Obeying his command, I gaze down at him between my thighs, his hair messy and pushed back, standing in a wave above his forehead, a lone lock falling down, only to be pushed back again, when he dips his head down. Half seeing, half imagining his mouth moving against me increases the sensation drastically, and I know, I just know, I won't be able to stay quiet as the slow buildup of my release begins. With one hand covering my mouth, and one buried in his curls, 
I being shifting my hips to meet his tongue. It just feels too good. I tug at his hair and feel him moan against me, sending me closer and closer harder, he gasps. What? He reaches up to the hand that I've threaded through his hair and places his hand on top of mine to tug at the roots of his hair he wants me to pull his hair. Do it, he says with a wanting look and then begins to move his fingers in fast circles and lowers his head to add his tongue to the sensation. I tug at his hair, hard, and he looks up at me, his eyes fluttering closed. When they open they're a bright, burning jade. He holds my gaze as my vision blurs and disappears momentarily. Come on, baby, he whispers. I notice his hand reach down between his legs, and I can't hold it any longer. I watch his hand stroking his hard cock, bringing himself to orgasm with me. I will never get used to the way his actions make me feel. Watching him touching himself, feeling the hot puffs of air against me as his breathing grows heavier you taste so fucking good, baby he moans against me, his hand moving quicker between his legs. I barely feel my teeth sinking into my palm as I ride out my high, still pulling at his hair. I blink. And blink some more, lazily. As I come back to consciousness, I feel him adjust his weight and lay his head on my stomach. I open my eyes, to find him with his closed, his chest moving up and down, his breath shallow. I lift him by his shoulder, and attempt to move between his legs. He stops and looks at me. I am, um, I'm already done, he says. I stare at him. I already came his voice is thick with exhaustion. Oh. He smiles a lazy, half-drunk smile and stands up from the bed. He strides over to the dresser and opens his bottom drawer grabbing a pair of white gym shorts. I need to shower and change, obviously. He points to the crotch of his jeans, where, despite their dark color, the wet spot is evident. Just like old times? I smile, and he looks at me, smiling back. Harding comes over and places a kiss on my forehead, then one on my lips. Good to know you haven't lost your touch, he says, walking to the door. It wasn't my touch, I remind him, and he shakes his head, leaving the room. I reach for my clothes at the end of the bed, praying that my father is still asleep on the couch, and that if by chance he is awake, he doesn't stop Hardin on his way to the bathroom. Seconds later the bathroom door closes, and I stand to get dressed. When I'm done I check my phone for a voicemail from Sandra, but there's nothing. What I do see, is the small envelope in the corner of my screen indicating a new text message, Maybe she's busy, and decided to text me. I click it open and read, I need to talk to you. I sigh when I next read the sender's name, said. I delete the message and set my phone back on the desk. Then curiosity gets the best of me, and I look around for Hardin's phone. My heart pounds as I remember the last time I went snooping through it. That didn't end well. But this time I know he's not hiding anything. He wouldn't be. We're in a completely different place now than we were before. He got a tattoo for me, he just won't move for me. I have nothing to worry about. Right? I check the dresser after not seeing it on the desk, then figure he must have taken it with him to the bathroom. Because that's normal, right? I have nothing to worry about. I'm just stressed and paranoid, I remind myself. Before I continue down the rabbit hole of worry, I remind myself that I shouldn't be going through his cell phone anyway, that I would be furious, if he did that to me. He probably does, though. I just haven't caught him. The bedroom door clicks open, and I jump, as if I've been caught, doing something I shouldn't be. Hardin strides in, shirtless, barefoot, wearing the gym shorts, the black line of his boxers showing. You okay? He asks, rubbing a white towel over his soaked hair. I love the way his hair appears black when it's wet. The contrast with his green eyes is something one can only dream about. Yeah. That wasn't a long shower. I sit down on the chair. I should have gotten you dirtier, I say, trying to distract him from the slight quaver in my voice. I was in a hurry to see you, he says unconvincingly. I smile. You're hungry, aren't you? Yeah, he admits with an amused grin. I got hungry. Thought so. Your dad's still asleep, is he going to stay here while we're gone? Excitement overtakes any worry I had. You're coming? Yeah, I guess. If it's as lame as I know it will be, 
I'm only staying one night. Okay, I say with understanding. But inside I'm beaming, knowing that he won't leave early. He just has to keep up appearances by complaining about this sort of thing. He licks his lips, and I think back to him between my thighs. Can I ask you something? I say. His eyes meet mine, and he nods. Yeah. He sits on the bed. When you know, was it because I was pulling your hair? What? He laughs lightly. When I pulled at your hair, you liked it. I flush. Yeah, I did. Oh. I can't imagine the shade of red I'm turning right now. Is that weird to you? That I liked it? No, I'm just curious, I tell him truthfully. Everyone has certain things they like during sex, that's one of mine. I didn't know it until just now, though. He smiles, completely unfazed that we're talking about this. Oh yeah? I get excited at the thought that he learns something new while with me. Yeah, he says. I mean, my hair's been pulled on by other girls, but it's different with you. Oh, I say for the tenth time, but this one leaves me feeling flat. Likely unaware of my reaction, Hardin looks at me with curiosity gleaming in his green eyes. Is there something you like that I haven't done? No, I like everything you do, I say softly. Yeah, I know, but is there something you've thought about doing before that we haven't done? I shake my head. Don't be embarrassed, baby, everyone has fantasies. I don't. At least, I don't think I do. I haven't had any experience outside of Hardin, and I don't know of anything else besides what we've done. You do, he says with a smile. We just have to find them. My stomach flutters, and I don't know what to say. But then my father's voice breaks our conversation. Tessie? My first thought is that I'm relieved that his voice sounds like it's coming from the living room and not the hallway. Hardin and I both stand. I'm going to use the restroom, I say. He nods with a wicked grin and heads into the living room to join my father. When I get into the bathroom, Hardin's phone is sitting on the edge of the sink. I know I shouldn't, but I can't stop myself. I immediately go to the call log, but it doesn't show. All the calls have been cleared. Not a single one is shown on the screen. I try again, and then look at the text message screen. Nothing. He's deleted everything, 